Welcome back, everyone, for this afternoon's agenda items. Let's start off with Brandon Muffley from Council Staff on Ecosystem Approach to Fisheries Management and Risk Assessment Review. Brandon, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the Council for uh, fitting this topic into your agenda this week. So I'm going to start off by giving an overview of the, the risk assessment and where it fits into our, our broader EAFM process and just refresh everybody's memory about our risk assessment and then dive into the actual review that we've been working on over the last over the last year. So with that, the the risk assessment is one component in our broader EAFM guidance document that the council initially approved back in 2016. And similar to the discussions that we were having earlier this morning on on the um, EFP stuff. Uh, the guidance, this is a guidance document. Uh, there is everything within here is non-regulatory, um, but the intent here was to highlight the different areas of, highlight a number of different areas within the ecosystem uh, in terms of where the council may want to focus incorporating ecosystem information into its various um, management decisions and into its various management documents. And so hopefully the information then and what comes out of our different work within our EAFM guidance document will ultimately inform council council decisions, even though it has a it's non-regulatory in nature. And so I'll talk about some of the specifics of how the risk assessment works within the actual um, guidance document. And so one component of the guidance document is the council's EAFM decision framework. And so the council was really interested in taking a very deliberative and structured approach to incorporating ecosystem information into its management process um, and sort of really thinking through how we are going to incorporate all of our ecosystem information and where it can fit into either our science and management process. So this is the decision framework that you all created. And the first step in that process is our risk assessment. And <laughs> excuse me. And so really the risk assessment is there for you all to sort of look across all of our all of our managed fisheries and identify those areas, those areas of risk um, to meeting our management objectives for our different FMPs and identify where you may want to sort of take a deeper dive into some of the issues to, to address it. So and I'll talk about the remaining steps a little bit later, but uh, just wanted to sort of orient you in terms of where the risk assessment sort of starts this entire process within our decision frame. So just a quick refresher in regards to what the risk assessment is actually doing. So we have a series of risk elements that the council identifies. So this is really what we are measuring. What are the any aspect that the council is worried about that may impact um, meeting our management goals and objectives for our different fisheries. So identifying what those particular risks are. And then once we've identified those risk elements, we come up with a definition, which is really why, why are we are measuring it? What's, what's the, what's the, what are we trying to clarify with this risk, with this risk element that we are considering including in our risk assessment? So why are we measuring it? Then we have indicators, and these can be qualitative, they can be quantitative in nature, but any sort of data or information that we have that can measure our level of risk. And then we use that information then to inform our risk ranking criteria to define how, how much risk this particular element is having. So anything from low risk to, to high risk. And the current risk assessment really is framed around how how much risk there are is in meeting our different council management objectives, mostly aligned with the Magnuson Act and the different national standards. So looking at risks to achieving optimal yield, supporting seafood production and recreational opportunities are sort of our resilience components, minimizing bycatch and protected species. So all things that you'd find in MSA and the different national standards that you all are, are trying to work on. So just one example here, this is a, a risk element that we have in our current risk assessment, uh, it's commercial revenue. And this is the, the definition associated with this one is to um, risk to maximizing commercial, commercial fishery revenue. 
And so this element is applied at the ecosystem level. We, uh, we apply our risk elements at different levels, either at the ecosystem level, so across all of our fishery management plans. Um, so there's one sort of risk that's assigned across all of our different fisheries, or we could break it down by, um, by fishery or, you know, or by species and fishery. So this one's applied at the ecosystem level, and we're using here revenue as our, as our proxy for commercial profits, which help us define what commercial revenue may be looking like. And so on the right-hand side is the information that we use. We are looking at, um, this is commercial revenue. The, the line in red is commercial revenue for our mid-Atlantic managed species. The, the line in black is revenue in the mid-Atlantic for all species that are landed within the mid-Atlantic. And then we utilize that information then to inform the risk criteria, which are on the left-hand side. And these are developed with the council in uh, identifying how we are going to assign risk and um, a significant long-term revenue decrease comes out as moderate high. So you can see that red, that red line has a purple line through it. So the trend line there in, indicates a significant long-term decline in commercial fisheries revenue. So that one scores out as moderate high. So that, that gives us what our risk is associated with commercial revenue across all of our different fisheries. And so we do this for all of the different risk elements that we have within our risk assessment. And at the end, you come up with this sort of um, evaluation across all of our fishery management plans, what the associated risk might be. So these are, this is what the risk assessment looked like in 2022, the last time we had updated it and gives you sort of a scorecard in some regards in terms of the associated risk, anything from low risk all the way to high risk. We have traditionally updated our risk assessment every year uh, as the state of the ecosystem report gets updated and we get the latest information from the year prior. We update our risk assessment and we present it to you all uh, as part of the state of the ecosystem report. We also present you with an updated risk assessment it's really hopefully giving you a snapshot about how risks may be changing over time within our across our different fisheries. So it's sort of a, a cheat sheet that this, you know, we give you this and gives you sort of an updated cheat sheet to look at risk as you're thinking about decisions throughout the rest of the year. We don't anticipate um, significant changes from year to year. Um, many of the risk assessments or risk elements that we are have included in the risk assessment aren't going to flip dramatically from one year to the next. Some of them certainly could, but many of them uh, look at long-term trends. So it takes a couple of years of data to see if a trend is changing or not. But you can see from our old risk assessment, from the initial risk assessment in 2017 to the last update in 2022, when you look at the ecosystem level risks, some things did change. Um, you know, we had most things actually um, across the ecosystem level actually decreased in risk, such as recreational value and fleet diversity. So some positives there. Um, but you can then look at the species and fleet levels. Uh, again, this is uh, looking at the commercial black sea bass uh, line. And here some risks from 2017 to 2022 increased for a couple of the risk elements and declined for some other elements for black sea bass. And so just to refresh your memory in terms of how we then, the practical application of how we've used this risk assessment in the past. And again, this goes back to the beginning in terms of looking at our structured decision framework that we've used. And Mike's not here to see his favorite figure. He loves that figure in the middle. It's his psychedelic figure on our conceptual model, but he's not gonna get a chance to see it. But what we've done is we take that risk assessment information, look at those risks across all of our fisheries and, and sectors and identify what's our fishery of, of highest risk or greatest priority. We came out with summer flounder. We then moved into conceptual modeling to really identify, you know, what's going on within, our, within the summer flounder stock and within our summer flounder fisheries, looking at those associated risks and what's going on within the environment driving those risks. Use that conceptual model then to identify a issue of of concern by the council and what came out of that was the, our management strategy evaluation looking at recreational discards in the summer flounder fishery. And 
I think we, and so we finalized those results in 2022. And I think we came out with a lot of positive information out of that, the modeling framework and some of the specific models we created out of our management strategy evaluation have been in, used to set recreational management measures in 2023. We're utilizing the management strategy evaluation framework that we created here to help us evaluate the recreational uh, Harvest Control Rule 2.0. I don't remember exactly what the new language is, but the recreational setting measures process, we're utilizing the management strategy evaluation to inform that. So this all started with risk assessment. And so there really is a direct application in terms of what we do within risk assessment and coming out with some really tangible results to inform management later on. So it's not something that we're just doing in a box that uh, really doesn't inform what the council does. I think there's a lot of direct application for creating this risk assessment. And so I said the initial risk assessment was done in 2017 and there's been a lot of time has passed since that assessment has, has taken place and a lot of things have changed, um, both in terms of information that we have, new risks, new and changing risks out on the water that are facing our different fisheries. And so I thought it was time to do a really comprehensive review and really dive into our risk assessment. So we identified a number of goals in terms of what we wanted to achieve again. So we wanted to make sure that this is reflective of our, our current priorities, our current risks that the, the council is interested in tracking, making sure that we're incorporating the latest scientific information. We have, there's a lot of new data, a lot of new analyses available that we can use to inform our risk assessment. I think we wanna make sure coming out of this that we're gonna create a document that's really sort of adaptive and, and can be responsive to new and changing conditions and council needs. I mean, we'll get into this a, a little bit later, but making sure that we can keep updating this risk assessment going forward and making sure that it's sort of incorporating all of the latest information and, and sort of is responsive to what you all want to utilize it for. And then hopefully thinking about an opportunity to expand how we utilize risk assessment information. You know, I talked about sort of how we've utilized it in the structured decision process, which I think is really important, but maybe there are other opportunities to utilize this information. So when the, AP, when the EOP committee and AP started this, we were really looking back at the last five years. How did the risk assessment work with the information we had over the last five years since it was initially implemented? And also thinking about what are our risks you know, in the future, what are the things sort of on the horizon that we need to be thinking about now so that we can prepare, be prepared within our risk assessment? So it was really sort of comprehensive where I guess, you know, thinking about 10 years worth of sort of information or thinking about risks across 10 years. So it was a really comprehensive look at what we might want to do with the risk assessment. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the process because Michelle has updated you uh, after each of our meetings, but I think the process was is really important here because the risk assessment, uh, as I just talked about, looking at really 10 years of, of information, thinking about future risks, it's a complex document, and, you know, and there's a lot of things going into it, but I think the process that we created was really important for us to get through everything that we needed to get through over the last year. And it was a really collaborative process with our EOP committee and the AP. Every meeting was held jointly, which I think is really critical to make sure that stakeholders are really engaged in the process and providing that feedback to the committee and ultimately back to the council. So we met five times between when we started our risk assessment in November of last year until our meeting last month. Uh, and we actually tasked the committee and AP with a bunch of homework in between meetings. Um, so there was a lot of work going on uh, over the last year. And throughout the process, we were looking at 43 different risk elements. Uh, 24 of them are, are in our existing risk assessment, and the EOP committee and AP came up with 19 new potentially risk elements to include in the, an updated risk assessment. And so we worked with those 43 elements or risk elements throughout the entire process. So we really uh, identified what risk elements we might want to develop at that first meeting in November. And then the rest of the time we worked on developing those and refining those, working on descriptions and definitions and indicators for all 43 of them. And we have some risk criteria for a subset of those 43. My focus here is going to be on the September meeting uh, in regards to the recommendations that came out of that meeting from the committee. And
And so of the, I'm going to go right to the punchline here, of the 43 elements that we consider, 28 um, of those elements are recommended to be included in the updated risk assessment. So all 24 existing risk elements, uh, the EOP committee and APR recommending we keep, and, we're ta and then adding four new risk elements. Six of the risk elements that we looked at over the course of the year, we are, they are recommending being placed in a parking lot. So they're important to be thinking about, but we just don't, we're not quite ready yet to either from a data perspective or from an analysis perspective or really understanding what we're trying to get at with some of these. They're important issues, but we're not quite ready yet to implement them and put them into the risk assessment. And then nine of the risk elements that we considered, uh, the, the committee and AP are recommending that we sort of remove those as standalone risk elements, but not necessarily remove them in terms of how they inform the risk assessment. So maybe they're gonna be used as indicators within a particular risk element. And just to point out of the 24, so all 24 of our existing risk elements, they are recommending stay within the new risk assessment. But that doesn't mean, um, only seven of those 24 risk elements are remaining unchanged. The committee and AP are recommending 17 of our existing risk elements are actually gonna have some sort of change. We're either changing the definition, changing the indicators that we're gonna be using, changing the, the risk criteria or some combination of all of those. So even though we're keeping all of the existing risk elements, we're making changes to many of the existing risk elements that we currently have. So we broke down the different risk elements into different sections. And so we have a series of 16 ecological risk elements here. Um, 11 of them, are, of the ecological risk elements that we looked at, 11 of them are recommended to remain, are recommended for inclusion in the updated risk assessment. Two of them we are recommending be put into the parking lot and three of them we are recommending to be uh, deleted. And I'm only going to focus on those new ones. So those with the black N behind them, those are the ones I'm going to dive into again. So if it's a, an existing risk element that we're talking about and keeping in the new one, I'm not going to go into those. Um, you should be just somewhat familiar with those and we'll, and we'll cover those next year uh, when we get the updated risk assessment. I'll talk about that later. So I'm just going to cover those new risk elements so you get a sense of where the committee and AP were on why we're recommending they be included, be parked, or be deleted. So for those that were either keeping or parking, uh, the one that's being added is offshore habitat. This was actually one of them that we considered in the original risk assessment. We have a lot more habitat, offshore habitat information than we did five years ago, six years ago now. We have a lot of modeling efforts that are going on. Um, both within the council and both within the center. So we believe, you know, we have all of this additional information. We have ability to create indicators and risk criteria. This is just one example here. This is looking at black sea bass habitat and how um, black sea bass uh, distribution habitat is, its distribution is changing over time and whether or not it's increasing or decreasing. This is just one indicator that we've come up with to utilize um, for our offshore habitat. We also considered population diversity, which is the risk associated with declining or changing population diversity. So looking at the size, sex, and reproductive sort of diversity within our individual stocks. Um, but the committee and AP thought we needed additional work to develop these indicators. Um, and we probably don't have the information for all of our different fisheries to cover some of these um, areas. So really the committee and AP said, maybe we should pilot a couple of these, pilot the development of some of these, particularly for some of those stocks that we do have a lot of information. So summer flounder, scup and black sea bass. Let's look at those, develop indicators for those and see how informative a population diversity risk element might be. And a similar sort of approach that we have for ecological diversity. So this is looking not at necessarily the species level like population diversity is, but this is sort of across the ecosystem and, and how much change might be occurring at ecosystem structure and function. We already do have a number of potential indicators from our state of the ecosystem. We have uh, diversity in, in um, indicators for lar 
for zooplankton larvae and adults, but um, the committee and AP weren't really sure how to interpret that information or how we would utilize it. So they thought more work was needed on that particular element. So those are proposing that we, we develop those and maybe include them in the future. For those risk elements under the ecological the risk elements that they're proposing to get rid of, um, one of them is a food web looking at sort of other interactions with HMS and shorebirds. Uh, we have three other um, food web risk elements that we are including in the risk assessment. And those, all three of those food web um, risk elements are looking at things differently than they are currently included in the risk assessment. They're taking a broader sort of look at things, which would include HMS and shorebirds and some of the other predator prey dynamics that are taking place. And so it was suggested we remove that one since it's already being incorporated in some of our other food web risk elements. There was discussion about incorporating a forage base uh, risk element, um, but instead the committee, this has been developed through the State of the Ecosystems era. HS has done a lot of work in this area and we included it last year within the State of the Ecosystem report for the first time. So now we have this sort of uh, comprehensive forage biomass index. But instead of it being a standalone risk, risk uh, element, the committee and AP are recommending that this be used as an indicator in some of our other risk elements that we have, such as the ecosystem productivity and our food web prey availability risk element. The group also looked at an invasive species risk element. Um, they really came out with this that, you know, Given where we are with invasive species within the Mid-Atlantic, we identified, we talked about some of them, such as blue catfish or green crabs or um, some harm, harmful algal blooms, but really they haven't presented any specific issues to, uh, to council managed species. So maybe this is just something we should be tracking right now. And maybe we would include it in, as an indicator under some of our habitat risk elements that we have. Moving on to the socioeconomic risk elements. Uh, again, so there's 16 uh, risk elements that we were considering here. We are keeping at 11 of them here as well. We're gonna keep them, or we are recommending they move forward with uh, being included in the updated risk assessment. Uh, three of them are being recommended to be part for further development and four of them are recommended for deletion. And again, dive into, into the, the new ones that we've considered and, and the rationale for why we are at with these recommendations. So one of the, one of the new ones that the, uh, we are recommending be included in the new risk assessment is recreational resilience and fleet diversity. This is something that we've had in the state of the ecosystem over the last few years. Uh, it's looking at the reduced um, resilience uh, in our recreational fishery due to declining diversity of recreational effort by fishing mode. Um, and so this is one of the indicators on the screen. You can see it's a declining, um, declining trend in regards to recreational fleet diversity and in, in regards to effort. Um, the committee and AP came up with some other indicators for development uh, that looks at sort of fishing behavior and preferences and how that may be changing over time. Are we moving away from, are we shifting from sort of a harvest focus to a catch and release focus and looking at how those preferences may be changing over time. So we have some other indicators that we're going to include within this recreational resilience risk element. The other two here, uh, actually three here. So we have recreational resilience shoreside support. So we have a very, we have a similar one on the commercial side that's already in our risk assessment. We have a commercial resilience shoreside support. Here we were looking at recreational shoreside support. So looking at marinas and bait and tackle shops and, and sort of the availability of these shoreside support for our recreational fishing industry. And here we were looking at the risks of reduced resilience due to, you know, sort of the changing or loss of shoreside support infrastructure. So there was a lot of interest from the committee and AP in, in regards to having this, but the, date, the data here is 
a little bit more spotty in terms of how the information that we have, how do we parse out what is a bait and tackle shop in terms of the information that we have. So there's interest in keeping this, uh, but continuing to work on the information that we have to see if we can come up with some, some indicators for this particular element. And then we also considered both commercial and recreational fishery employment. So these would be two separate risk elements, one for the commercial sector, one for the recreational sector and risks to not optimizing or maintaining um, employment within both the commercial and recreational fisheries. It's been discussion about what optimizing might mean or what maintaining might be. So we have some work to do in regards to what's our risk that we're trying to track. Uh, the group identified some potential data sources, particularly using BTR information um, that we could use to uh, as indicators, but some more work needs to happen here before we can really bring this forward and evaluate changes in employment within the sectors. And then for those that were actually deleting, we thought of a number of um, commercial fishery resilience, and I just gr grouped them all here in, in one bullet. But we were looking at uh, access to capital, um, insurance availability, emerging markets and, and opportunities. And so these are really just trying to account for all the different business and economic pressures on the commercial fishing operations. But the information we have for some of these different pieces is a, it's either lacking or the information that we do have is really variable and how we would apply it um, was really uncertain. So the committee and AP thought that we want to make sure we can are, are tracking some of these things, but maybe we can include them as indicators in the future once some of the information sort of gets more fully developed. And we're tracking, you know, economic elements in some of our other risk elements instead of, you know, we maybe we're okay tracking, you know, uh, sort of commercial resilience in some of our other risk elements. And then seafood safety was another one that the group talked about, but we, we never really fully developed sort of the, the element uh, definition or focus for this. It, it wasn't really on human health risks. It was, um, again, some more work needed to be done here. So we dropped this for now and sort of maybe we can consider it uh, under some of our other fishery resilience elements. Then finally under, we have uh, 11 management risk elements. Um, eight of them are recommended to be included in the updated risk assessment. One of them would be put into the parking lot and two of them would be. So a big focus here in regards to those are risk elements associated with offshore wind. So in our current risk assessment, we have this uh, risk element called other ocean uses and offshore wind has been accounted for in that um, in a general sense, but a lot has changed since 2017 in regards to offshore wind and the committee and AP were really interested in making sure that we call out offshore wind as a sort of a separate risk um, that we are tracking specifically. And so there, I mean, we had a lot of discussions about how many elements in regards to offshore wind should we have, what should be the focus of them. And we ultimately settled on two different offshore wind um, risk elements. One would be focusing on the biological and ecosystem risks. Um, associated with stock productivity, distribution, and ecosystem structure and function. Um, we've identified some indicators, but those need some development yet. And, um, you know, once we develop those indicators a little bit, we can come up with risk criteria. Then the second offshore wind risk element would be fishery science and fishery access. So looking at the, the risks of not achieving optimal yield due to fishery impacts due to you know, changing access within the offshore wind lease areas and the changes in scientific uncertainty because of the implications for our federal surveys. We had talked about that earlier this morning as well. So we have a number of indicators for this one. Many of them are already created through the State of the Ecosystem Report. So now that we have those indicators, we're going to develop the criteria um, to evaluate um, that information. Then the third one here, for the parking lot, the first one for the parking lot is an essential fish habitat. Now we do have other habitat risk elements, but those more focus on the biological implications of changing habitat. The committee and AP were 
really supportive of having separate something separate in regards to habitat, right? The council has a distinct role in defining essential fish habitat. So this is a little bit different than the biological implications. This has a management component to it. So this is risk to not identifying or protected essential fish habitat. But we're recommending it be parked because the council is currently working on its omnibus EFH amendment. And I think a lot of the work products that come out of that, just can I have already been talking about a, a lot of how we can utilize the information that's coming out of the development of that amendment, how we can utilize that here for indicators and identifying risks. So once we that the amendments a little bit further along or once it's finished, then we have something to roll right into here and we can get the this particular risk element added to the risk assessment. And then the two that were recommended be deleted, the, the group talked about offshore energy exclusive of wind. So those risks to non wind related energy development. So LNG, um, tidal uh, energy development. So all, all of these other things that might be going on, but given, a, given the limited activity so far in the mid Atlantic, felt we should just track this for now and maybe include it as an indicator um, going forward. And similarly for aquaculture, thinking about the risk to uh, access due to offshore aquaculture, but again, limited development so far in the mid-Atlantic, let's continue to track it and maybe we utilize it as a, as an indicator under our other ocean activities risk element that we have. So where do we go? So today it's really for the council is to determine what risk elements we want to include in the revised risk assessment. So that's what I just stepped through in terms of the committee and AP recommendations. They're recommending 28 risk elements be included, uh, parking lot, some of them, and deleting some of the other ones, but looking for the council to either support those recommendations or modify them in regards to what we should include in an updated risk assessment. Technical staff, myself, and the folks from the Science Center are working. We're already there. Folks are already starting to develop the 2024 State of the Ecosystem. A lot of the indicators that are in our State of the Ecosystem feed right into our risk assessment. So we'll take all of the feedback that we get from you all today, the feedback that we've received from the committee and AP. We're going to work on those indicators and the risk ranking criteria plan would be to present a draft updated risk assessment to the EOP committee and AP in March of next year, get final uh, feedback and recommendations because maybe once you see the indicators and the risk ranking criteria that we have for a particular element, maybe you and at that point you think it's not ready yet. So maybe we want to drop a risk element that we are thinking of including now, maybe we want to drop it once we see all of the information. So we'll bring all of that information to you all at your April uh, council meeting next year. That's, your, that's the time of year you always get the state of the ecosystem report. It's when we traditionally present you the updated risk assessment. So you'll get a comprehensive look at everything ecosystem going on within the mid-Atlantic. And hopefully there you would approve the updated risk assessment and you move it for use. And as part of that review, I'm hoping we're also going to have a process outlined for you all to consider about how we update um, and modify the risk assessment going forward. So this review has been pretty intensive, and we're hoping we can make the risk assessment a little bit more flexible to add new risk elements or add indicators to it without having to go through this comprehensive review that maybe we can make adjustments on a, you know, Within a, within a given year, given the new information that we have. So we'll outline a new process for you in April as well. And something that the council, that the committee and AP talked about a little bit, and I'll get that into in the next slide, is how we can utilize this information more than we currently do. And we have that st structured decision framework, but where else can we plug this information into the council process? Some of those things that we've talked about, again, utilizing it within the decision framework. So conceptual modeling, management strategy evaluation, really getting into a specific priority issue that the council sees that's been identified within our risk assessment, continuing to update those on an annual basis so you can see how risks are changing across our different fisheries. But maybe there are ways to incorporate it into some of our other council products, like our fishery information documents, incorporating more ecosystem information there, presenting some of this information to our APs as they develop their fishery performance reports and have them give feedback in regards to some of the 
ecosystem changes that they're seeing within their fisheries. And then maybe we can integrate these disinformation into some of our broader um, areas as well. So the scenario planning outlined um, risk assessments as an area to focus and utilize ecosystem information going forward. So how can we connect this with the scenario planning outcomes? Uh, the Science Center is working on these ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles. We have them for bluefish. We're going to have one for black sea bass that's incorporating ecosystem information at the single species level. And our SSC ecosystem work group has been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years. Where can we integrate the work we're doing here with what the SSC is doing within their ecosystem work as well? So the outcomes for today is for you all to decide which risk elements, you know, what's, what's the scope of the risk elements we want to include in the 2024 risk assessment. Um, so do you support what the EOP committee and AP recommended or do you want to make modifications to that? You'll look at the updated risk assessment in 2024. And, uh, and if you guys have any other feedback beyond just the risk elements, if you have feedback on the definitions that we're thinking about or the indicators or the data that might be available that maybe we've been missing in the documents that we have, open to any of that, that feedback as well. So that's it for today. And I just want to thank uh, Sarah, Sarah Gaitchis and Garrett Piper are online for any potential questions. They've been really instrumental in moving this ball forward. Just thank the committee and AP. This has been a really intensive process and a lot of work has gone on to this in the last year and everybody's been really engaged in the process. So I think we've come up with a, some really good changes and updates to our risk assessment that I think can be really informative for the council going. Forward. I'll take any questions, Mr. Chair. Brandon, it was a, quite a bit of stuff in a short amount of time. So if I can wrap my head around all of it. Um, any comments from around the table? Anything that council members like? Anything that the council members don't like? I see nothing at the moment. Uh, is all council, we don't really have to have a motion to support this document going forward. Uh, is everybody happy with the way it is? Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I mean, obviously, I've been part of that process, so I, you know, very supportive of all the work that. The committee has done in coordination with Brandon and Sarah and Garrett. I mean, we really could not have gotten this done without them. And I appreciate you know, their willingness to you know, entertain and accommodate any ideas that the committee members and advisors had with respect to indicators that could potentially develop for any of the different risk elements that we were considering. It really was maybe a little bit more work than I think we had anticipated when we first laid out our initial plan for how to tackle this. And I think you know, we all agree we'd like something that's a little bit more adaptive as we go down the road. You know, the state of the ecosystem reports have been a really incredible driver for this process. And um, you know, we'd like to be able to, I think, incorporate additional indicators sooner. Um, you know, obviously more are incorporated into the state of the ecosystem report as the the information and analyses become available, but being able to include those in the risk assessment itself without having to wait for a five-year process, I think, would benefit the council as we to integrate um, the system uh, information into the rest of our. Any other comments? Questions, concerns? Brandon? Yeah, thank, thanks, Mr. Chair. I mean, I, I think, um, as Michelle indicated, and I think you could see here, I, we considered a lot, right? And the risk assessment now is already a lot. I think we're trying to account for changing risks that the council is seeing um, and making sure that that's being reflected in the risk assessment. But 
also not overwhelming ourselves. There's already a lot there, but making sure that the information that we are, that we're gonna put into a risk assessment um, isn't too overwhelming. It identifies those risks that the council is most interested in, um, but isn't so much information that we don't know what to do with it. And so it's trying to find that, that right balance of, of enough information to sort of guide and understand where those risks are, but not too much information that we get lost and where we might utilize that information. And, and hopefully, um, as I demonstrated through our decision framework, that this risk assessment is really important in terms of what, it's, what it can do. I mean, I, I think the conceptual model and the management strategy evaluation that we did because of the risk assessment that we put in place had some really positive benefits for what the council is doing, particularly within our recreational fisheries, and we're continuing to utilize that information. And so um, it's not just something that we're sort of, you know, putting together and it's, and it's interesting. I think it has some real tangible benefits, and I think there are other opportunities to utilize this information. And so hopefully we're going to create something that's informative for you all, that we can continue to grow the, our ecosystem work and utilize it more within the management process. Is there any objection, council members, that we go ahead and support the EOP committee and AP recommendations for the risk elements to be included in the 2024 risk assessment report? Seeing none, Brandon, I guess we will see you again in April. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yep, thank you very much. Let's go on to our next agenda item. We're going to go with uh, receive a presentation on private recreational tile fish permitting and reporting. And we're going to have presenters, Christopher, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce your last name. I don't want to butcher it. And Doug Potts. And Hannah and Jose will be here from staff. Are you Christopher and Doug, are you ready? Can you hear me okay on your end? Yes. Hi, my name is Chris Winiarski. Um, I'm with the APSD group, uh, a statistician out of the uh, NOAA's GARFO office. And I'm going to talk today about um, some data coming out of the private rec tile fish DTR program that started in uh, 2020. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So uh, these are some of the topics that were uh, requested by the committee that I'm going to walk through today excuse me one second um we're all getting our 220 notifications from the emergency broad or emergency alert system so give us just a minute and everybody's phone will quit going off okay All right, I think we got all of our phones shut off here now. Okay, sounds good. Um, Thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna um, walk through some of the data looking at uh, total tile fish landings out of the private rec program, um, total numbers of permits issued each year, uh, take a look at the active permits with landed tile fish, uh, number of trips reporting uh, tile fish, activity and um, also explore uh, permit denial, whether that's been an issue and take a look at some of the software and uh, some of the data from information from vendors uh, working with the uh, private reptile fish program and uh, then touch on some uh, plans to build on some of the past uh, research efforts with the program. So next slide. Uh, so just a broader overview since the start of the program in August in, of 2020, we've had close to 2,000 tile fish landed, um, about 1,132 blue line tile fish, 783 golden tile fish, and 107 tile fish with the species unknown. Um, and we've had just over 3,000 private uh, reptile fish 
permits issued to just over 1,500 vessels and in total 146 private reptile fish VTRs, uh, 43 of those VTRs, including landings of both blue line and golden, 59 just blue line tile fish, and uh, 37 uh, just golden tile fish landed. Next slide. Um, so this is just a look uh, spatially, geographically at the, uh, the number of blue line tile fish reported through the program. Um, as you can see here, most, most of those landings are um, coming through Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey, um, to be expected based on the geographic distribution of blue line tile fish. Next slide. Um, and then this, this figure here is a look at the total number of blue line tile fish landed with a number of fish on the Y axis. Um, and we got the permit year on the X axis. And then these different colored boxes here are just what I call uh, tile fish permit combination, um, where you can have in green here vessels that just had the, the private rec permit. Um, the lighter blue is are folks that had the private rec permit and a party charter, charter permit. Um, the purple color uh, was a vessel that had um, the private rec permit, party charter, and a commercial permit. And then a little bit surprising, uh, we also had fish reported through the, uh, you know, the rec tile fish program that just had a party charter tile fish permit or a uh, party charter and commercial permit. Um, and you can see that most of the blue line here are coming through um, with vessels with just a private rec permit, but there's also a good amount that are um, coming from these vessels with both the private rec and party charter permit. And just a note there, 2023, um, you know, we don't have all our data here, so numbers there are a bit lower, although I will say we are kind of past the, you know, the peak of the, uh, you know, the tile fish season, I would say. Um, so I've got some slides looking at that later on in the talk. Um, and then again, in 2020, you know, that pro program started late in August. So it's just, a, you know, a portion of the year um, that we have data for, for 2020. Next slide. Uh, here's a look at the total number of golden tile fish reported on private rec VTRs. Um, and here you can see that, you know, further ship no uh, shift north with uh, more fish coming from New Jersey, New York State. Um, and I should note here that this is the um, this is the state based on the the port coming from the VTR for that this map with the golden tile fish and that previous one with with blue line um, that's um, linking linking the landing to the to the state. So next slide. Um, here's a look at the number of golden tile fish here in this uh, same figure where um, it seems like here with the golden tile fish, uh, we have more fish that are coming, you know, straight from that from vessels with just a private rec permit. Um, you know, some coming from uh, like, in, you know, a decent number 2023 coming from vessels with vessels with uh, private rec, party charter, and commercial permits. Um, but for some reason, it seems like, uh, at least with gold and that, uh, more fish are coming from vessels with just a straight uh, private rec tile fish permit. Next slide. This is a look here at the, uh, the number of permits by year. Um, you can see in that first year, we had 447. And it looks like um, in the last couple of years here, maybe this number of permits is beginning to plateau a bit. We had 946 in 2023. Um, it looks like in the last couple of years, we've had, you know, close to 300 permits that don't don't renew, um, but a pretty good number of permits that do renew. Um, and we had, you know, a lo lower number of new permits in 2023. So. Um, yeah, maybe this, maybe this number is going to stay kind of around 900 or a thousand, 
um, as we move forward these next couple of years. Next slide. Uh, this is the number of uh, vessels with a permit by by state, and this is in this map here. Uh, state is linked to the the home state of the vessel, so um, you know most of the vessels being registered out of New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, um, Pennsylvania, New York State, as I think we would expect. Next slide. So this is the number of active permits uh, reporting tile fish in a given year. Um, so you can see in the last couple of years, we've had you know, 28 in 2021, 2020, uh, 20, 32, sorry, in uh, 2022. And next slide. So only, you know, only about 4% of those total permits in the last couple of years have been active and again 2023 with that latest data poll you know getting data up to, until mid-september we're only about at about two percent of those permits uh, being active next slide i also looked at the uh, average number of tile fish landed per active permit in year um, and this was a little interesting where it seems like there's been an increase through time with, um, you know, folks uh, reporting more fish per, per active permit. Um, not quite sure why that would be the case, but it seems like that's been trending upward since the beginning of the program. Next slide. So this is the number of private uh, wreck trips instead of numbers of fish here in this figure. So um, this is a bit repetitive of those previous figures looking at number of golden or blue line. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of, you know, we're getting, again, most of those trips um, coming from the just vessels with a private wreck permit. Um, Again, in this latest year, it seems like we're in terms of those uh, private wreck trips from those vessels with just a private wreck permit. We're kind of, you know, definitely seem to be behind what we were seeing in the last couple of years. Where, you know, it's interesting here those those other vessels with these other permit combinations seem to be in line. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but hopefully, um, you know, in this next month. Uh, we start having some more private wreck trips uh, rolling into the system. Next slide. Yeah, this was just taking a closer look. Um, you know, when I was seeing that, um, you know, it still seemed like there was some data that needed to be coming in for 2023. This is, you know, the mean number of trips in those last couple of years by month. And, you know, you still have a decent number of trips in September but it starts to decrease as you move into October and into November, December. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting. I wish, uh, I wish we were, I was giving this talk a month from now and have a clearer picture, I think. Um, but, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we're just, uh, we're lagging a little bit in some of the trips coming into the system. Next slide. So this is the number of uh, trips per permit in year. Um, again, 2020 was the, a weird year with that starting late. Um, but this first look, I just clipped the data for each year through September, and it you know does look like there's a, a decrease in the number of trips being reported by permit. Um, but if you go to the next slide. When I just when I look at the whole year, um, it looks like for the the past twenty one and twenty two, that number of trips per permit um, has maybe been you know consistent. So again, it'll be interesting if uh, two thousand twenty three is similar or if there is a you know decent decline in the the number of trips being reported by permit. Next slide. I talked to Ted Hawes and our group about permit denials. He's the head of the permit group. 
you said that there's just been four vessels, two in 22 and two in 23 that had their renewal application held up just because they had non-compliance issues with their commercial VTRs. You said that GARFA requires an applicant um, to provide uh, valid, you know, registration, Coast Guard documentation, both at when they first apply and with renewals, but he said that they haven't been tracking the number of applicants not accepted because of uh, registration or, or the Coast Guard documentation. Next slide. Um, I also looked at the number of trips reported. Um, here are the different colors or the different uh, software avenues for folks to report private uh, tilefish wreck trips. Um, and so in red ACCSP, you know, they can, uh, you can report private trips, but then also party charter commercial. I think the same is true with fish online. Um, but then with Ethan, uh, you're only able to report private tilefish wreck trips. Um, so again, it, you know, it seems like compared to the last two fishing years, um, you know, we've only had seven trips so far that have come through uh, with that software. Next slide. And this is just a look uh, by that vendor. And then again, by this uh, tile fish permit combination. So you can see um, Ethan is, you know, in that last box where, um, you know, it's pretty much mostly all green that you're getting uh, just vessels with a private reptile fish trip. Um, and you can see here that with uh, ACCSP and fish online, you're getting a mix of vessels reporting with a different combination of uh, permits. Next slide. I emailed Ethan the other day to inquire if they just asked if they had any software issues and uh, just some curiosity I had about these 2023 trips. Um, and they just said they haven't had any issues with the software. Any updates needed are handled on our side and new releases, releases can be pushed into the store when needed. And they claim it's been a stable app without any known issues. Um, and they also said that there's no lag um, from when users put in the trip uh, to when it's uh, seen by Garpo. Um, and I believe uh, folks have to enter that information within 24 hours of the trip. Next slide. So just some takeaways. Um, the number of annual private reptile fish permits seems to be plateauing. Um, the number of trips reported per permit, number of active permits may be decreasing in 2023. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens in the next month here. You know, that could signal a decrease with rec anglers submitting their VTRs, um, but there's a lot of other factors too. So I think if that's even the case, it's hard to, you know, pin it on VTR reporting rates. I mean, maybe other types of fishing have been, you know, really good. So folks are putting less effort into tile fish fishing, or maybe it's related to weather, um, I'm not sure. So next slide. Um, so this private reptile fish information, it's at the same scale at the trip level. We have our, our VTR summarized in our, our CAMS database. Um, these private rec trips live in this CAMS VTR rec table uh, for end users. And um, the rec trips are folks report the number count of fish. Um, and that's currently how tile fish are represented in the database. Um, but there is a support table uh, where for some species it has a conversion uh, from, you know, count of fish to weight of fish. Um, so I don't have any values in that support table now for blue line or golden tile fish, but um, if I can get some values and a consensus there, I could, um, you know, we could be getting weights from uh, this data source that could be used for assessments or, uh, you know, other other applications. Um, so these, you know, these these VTR reporting rates are unknown. So it's 
it's difficult to know the true total number of trips and number of, you know, true number of tilefish landed. Um, you could estimate BTR reporting rates potentially, or, you know, you could use alternative methods, maybe survey data that could potentially give you more accurate estimate of the number of tilefish trips and the, the number of total landed tilefish. Um, but I will say that those approaches, um, you know, come at the loss of having, uh, you know, the information that we're getting from these VTRs at the trip level. Next slide. Maybe I'll let uh, Hannah or Jose jump in at this point, as I know this is uh, some of the things they've been working on. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And before we turn it back over to the council for discussion, um, just wanted to touch on this communication outreach topic. Um, we had some discussion yesterday, but um, since the last time we reviewed this information in 2022, um, we've received feedback from the council at multiple meetings, as well as our tilefish and our communications and outreach APs. And so we've been working on a number of things, um, including, so there were improvements made to our uh, recreational permitting and reporting webpage on our website. Um, this was an effort to really streamline the information and make it easy to follow. Um, so if anglers have questions, it's a resource they could turn to. Um, also based on AP feedback, um, we obtained permit holder information from the tilefish permit holders, as well as HMS permit holders. Um, for any future targeted communication efforts, you know, if we wanted to send them messages or emails or whatever have you, we have that information in hand. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, we also put in a proposal to ACCSP um, to hopefully acquire some funds. Um, this proposal was submitted um, in coordination with uh, Harborlight. That's the um, company that created EFIN. Um, so this would, you know, have some outreach components to it, as well as improving the metadata collected through that application. Um, and improving that metadata can really help with future communication um, with these anglers, you know, knowing who, where, when, why, and how sort of thing. Um, we are also looking into hiring a contractor to help with any additional efforts, um, which based on the conversation yesterday, this could include anything from evaluating the program or other ideas to improve overall compliance. Um, and then I'd also just like to note that these last two bullets, if we do get the ACCSP funding and we hire a contractor, that'll be a coordinated effort um, just to minimize any potential communication uh, or uh, confusion with anglers or duplicating efforts and things like that. Um, and with that, uh, that concludes the presentation. I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Hannah. Any questions, comments? Around the table, Dan Barnum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does anybody know? Do, do private recreational HMS permit holders have to report their landings? Yeah. So they have. Oh, sorry. Uh, they have to report their landings for certain species. Um, I believe it's billfish and bluefin tuna, um, and sharks. Yeah. Um, but they don't, they don't have, like for our tilefish, you have to report whether you land them or don't land them. HMS species is just if you land them. So they're not capturing that effort component. Follow up. Do, I know on the commercial side for the HM, HMS permit, to renew my permit, I have to file did not fish reports every month I did not fish. Is that accurate for the recreational side too? Does anybody know? I don't believe they have to report a uh, do not fish report. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Go to me now. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chair. One of the questions that has kind of come up during this presentation is if 2023 decreases were weather related. So I was just thinking on it. That could be tracked through AP comments, you know, year to year. If, if I think it's, we've got a pretty good representation of even, you know, even, even would be helpful if commercial guys are saying whether or not whether it was bad but with the commercial and rec folks on the AP just tracking that reported bad weather errors so to speak and say 
Joe. I think not only with bad weather, but I think fuel costs may be keeping some of them at home as well. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess maybe I just am trying to make sure that I understand this um, properly. So looking at uh, like the slides that are showing the trips by, you know, a, a vessel's tilefish permit combination. So it looks like, if I'm understanding this right, that there are some reports coming in by folks that just have a part or chart party charter or party charter and commercial permit. In other words, they don't have the recreational, the private recreational tile fish permit. So, okay, so I'm seeing heads not, so I'm not incorrect in that. And then I was just curious if there's been any further digging into that, because it looks like, um, I think like based on the information shown in slide 19, that most of that is coming from either Fish online or reporting through ACCSP. So I'm just wondering if maybe those were, were those like miscoded trips, you know, people were actually reporting for, you know, a regular party charter trip or whether they were reporting for a regular commercial trip, if there's been investigation into that. Chris, I don't know if you're online and want to take that one. I know you kind of dug into this and we, we had a couple conversations over email. Yeah, I guess um, it's hard for me to know pulling the data. I mean, I can see those as private rec trips um, with the code they have, but um, yeah, I guess maybe maybe with that software with those with those two avenues of reporting, like you know, maybe that allows you to do that, so it doesn't you know, there's no warning like, hey, you know, I guess that software wouldn't know if you have that permit or not, right? So. Um, I'm assuming that it was let someone report a wreck trip in reptile fish, even though they don't have that permit, right? So, yeah, it's hard to know if it's, you know, that was a wreck trip and that's correct and they just didn't have the permit or they just incorrectly put, you know, reported that as, you know, a private reptile fish trip. Anna. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, um, through the, different ACC SP applications, those are also if you're a for hire entity or a commercial entity, you you fill out the same exact information regardless what kind of trip. So it's very possible that it could have been some sort of mistake. And that's why I asked and it's like the, the actual application does not date for that reporting. Yeah. Chris, I got a question. The permits that weren't renewed was enforcement brought into that since there was two on the two years? Was enforcement brought in? And how would you know that they weren't filling out forms? Yes, if you don't have to file a do not fish report. Is that just on commercial? Uh, well, I'm just looking. And the only uh, way that I got at that was just, you know, looking at the permits in the current year and then seeing if that was a, you know, a permit in the previous year. Um, so I don't, yeah, so that's how I, that's how I looked at, you know, how many permits are renewing. Um, I don't think there's any way, at least through, you know, the databases I'm working with to know, you know, whether those folks that didn't renew, if they had enforcement issues or, or what led them to, to not renew. Um, but that's, that's something I can try to dig into a little more. Mike Belisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean no disrespect by this question for the people who work on and have spent time developing this program. Um, but I'm wondering what, are, so maybe Chris, maybe you can help me answer the question of what are we getting, what are we getting from it? If you can't, if you have a thousand permits that you issue, don't know whether or not anyone is active on any given day because they don't need to tell us they're not active. And then if they come back with tilefish and for whatever reason they decide not to report them and they make it home without being challenged by enforcement, 
So we, we captured nothing. Um, I, this, in my mind, this tilefish reporting program was kind of a first step at maybe getting into some of, some of the larger fisheries that we deal with recreationally to try to understand catch and, and effort uh, as a separate element from the MRIP program to maybe as a ground truthing or a way to move forward perhaps in some degree. I'm just wondering, I mean, there are a lot of really nice graphs and teased out some data from what we captured, but is there any confidence in anything that, that we're seeing? Um, is there any kind of estimate that can be drawn from the information that we're collecting? And in your opinion, I mean, what is it that we're getting out of this? Because if there isn't anything really instrumental coming out of the program, then I think the council, we need to think about whether or not we need to add some further, some additional elements to it, to try to get some enforcement of the action, to generate the information that we need. Started spinning and talking in a circle there, but I'll stop myself um, and see if anybody has any thoughts on that one, whether Hannah or, or Chris or whoever. Thanks. Jose? That's a very good question. If I were to look at this information by itself without knowing things that I know from other surveys, I will say it is what it is. That's just what we're getting. That's how much fish are being caught. <clears throat> However, when you look at HMS numbers, when you look at the large pelagic survey, understand that's a dedicated survey for large pelagics, okay? However, there is reporting of other species that are being landed, right? So they have a, a, an intercept survey, they have a, a front survey, and they're targeting the people that are involved in the fisher. And one thing that we did with the, uh, uh, the, the Golden Tilefish uh, Stock Assessment uh, work group is that we were looking at a time series of recreational landings use incorporated into the assessment. And we look at various data sources. And one of them was the large pelagic survey. When I look at the number of recreational golden tile fish that are being reported in that survey, it's 10 times more than what, what, what we're capturing in this VTR data. And when I saw that, I immediately, you know, we, we have a problem. There is an issue, and and I think from my perspective, I don't know, it might be good to dig into this, but, you know, if you're an HMS permit holder and you don't report, you're in trouble. You lose your HMS permit. There is, there is, there is a cost not reporting. Perhaps we don't have a, a real tangible cost with not reporting on their uh, the VTR system. Now, that's my, just my humble opinion. Uh, so so I, I, I do agree with you. Uh, I, I think there is a, there is a, a lot more work that we need to do to see if we can improve this, but there, there, there is a large discrepancy mm -hmm. numbers between LPS and, and VTR. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. So I was under the impression that while the LPS is a survey, as you described. This project, this was supposed to be a census of the action of every of all of it. It wasn't supposed to be. Estimates weren't supposed to be generated. From the data, the estimate was supposed to be the data that we collected. So I think we have a long way to go. Um, I don't have any answers and. Uh, I know. Our HMS program in this in Maryland, in my state, we are one of two states, I believe, that has a catch reporting program uh, for HMS species. Not only do the fish that come through Ocean City's port need to be reported, but a tag needs to be affixed to the fish in some in some place so that once it's offloaded, it can be considered counted. So. Not that I'm suggesting we do tagging on blue line tilefish because I that's I hear that all the time. 
why don't you just get guys and fishermen to tag their fish so we know exactly how many were caught. Well, that's, it's easier said than done. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't remember where I even started on that one. But yeah, I think, I think we have a lot of work to do to, make, to get this happening. I know the question came up in our priority setting uh, talking about how to, how to make this better, whether outreach is enough or do we need to entertain and work with our law enforcement groups to really, and to, to your point, Jose, there should be some cost to not following the rules. You, when you sign up for a permit and you check the box that says, I, I declare that I will comply with any provisions within this permit, there should be some, some stick um, to get you to do that so you can get it the following year. That's it, thanks. Peter Hughes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the invitation, kind of along the same lines of enforcement. We have one slide that shows uh, the years 2020. So about a thousand permitted anglers, and then a slide that shows reporting to seven. I don't have the slide in front of me. That to me would be a signal of very low compliance uh, with reporting. But then when you go to your slide that shows the number that was taken. It would seem that the reporting doesn't look as dreadful as it is based on taken the number of permitted vessels. Slide there that has taken that. Next slide. Four percent. So uh, we did hear you know, a recommendation about the uh, maybe a recommendation is to engage wild fish committee, have a conversation, start the conversation. How do we address this? Maybe it's the 24 hour requirement has to be uh, tailored or changed to be reflective of it has to be reported before the fish vote. Just, just some thought that 24 hours you can make a lot of. And Neil. Hello, um, you know, I am one of these tile fish permit holders that has not reported because I haven't caught any tile fish. I'm catching up to stuff. Um, one of our potential actions uh, is to require a, a did not fish report. Uh, and so that's been something that's been there, I guess, since I've been on this council. And so would that be helpful to have recreational anglers uh, at the end of the year? Uh, that didn't report tile fish, but if they if because they didn't fish, report that. So that, that's it. Just a question whether we should move that potential action to a uh, action. Thank you, Ken. Paul Ricci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been speaking to a lot of people about this in the past few years, and it's amazing how honest they are. Some people don't know that they're supposed to have a permit. Plenty of people know they're supposed to have a permit and they have no intention of getting one. And plenty of people have permits and they have no intention of filing reports. Simple. Um, how do you get around that is the problem. Like Mike said, this is a great segue into getting more information out of fishermen right from the fishermen. I think it's important. I think we're starting with a tough demographic because these guys are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for a trip and worrying about a $25 fine for not reporting, it's, it's not a big deal for them. And then when we get it to enforcement, which I feel we should, it's time to have enforcement start writing some paper, that's tough too, because as Peter said, is 24 hours to put a, a report in. Now, 
for a for hire trip, as soon as one passenger or one fish leaves that embarking area, you have to have that trip piled. But these guys, they all go home at the same time. So a little tighter regulation as to when the report has to be put in. Um, a did not fish report is not going to, in my opinion, is not going to help because if everybody goes home with that fish for the month or the year, they put in the did not fish report because of no incentive to put in a VTR. So I think enforcement needs to get involved and maybe we can look at things. I, I, I do think did not fish will be helpful because it is a little bit of incentive, but it's not, it's not a silver bullet. Thank you. Dan Farnham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, I agree with Paul on one aspect, the, the do not fish report. People are just going to check the box just to renew their permit, but, but at least it's a start. I mean, in my mind, like Mike said before, this is a pilot study to try and get more accurate reporting across the whole recreational range, but all the species that we manage. So uh, there's got to be a way to entice these permit holders to report. More. We're never going to get a, a high percentage of ac accurate reporting, but at least try and work this program out so we're getting more and better information. Scott Lennox. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, this is tough. I, I, I told you guys yesterday I brought this up at our local level because recreational anglers just don't report fish. They're very reactive. We are very reactive. We see stricter regulations coming down the pipeline. That's when we start raising our voices. But when it comes to helping things out in the beginning, um, not as not so helpful unless there's some sort of unless there's some sort of enforcement. I really think the way to get this done, both with for hire um, boats and with recreational private boats, is some sort of uh, penalty for not reporting. Like you, you don't get your permit. Your permit the following year. I think that's a way to go. I think we talk about this coming. You know, we should have some committee meetings uh, and go through this because there's going to be a lot of great ideas. I think coming from lots of different angles, put it all in a, in a place where the committees can talk about it and then bring it to the um, count, full council and maybe move forward with it. Because Mike's right, this was this was set up to be um, the information, you know, the information that we get, not just an estimate on information or an idea about the information. And it's just not working out that way. With 2% um, compliance, that, that's that's terrible. That's non-existent. Um, and I think we spoke at dinner the other night. There's a certain amount of blue line tile fish that are reported through the uh, reporting apps. And then it's an astronomically much higher number for during the surveys, the HMS surveys, and the blue line and, and golden tiles are reported at a much higher level when the HMS survey goes out. So I do think it's something we need to work on, and it's a a good start would be, I think, the committee levels. Thank you. Johnny Gwynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for that presentation. It was eye-opening. Um, as a commercial fisherman, I have had it drilled into my head on how important reporting is. Matter of fact, I'd have a tattoo I would show you of report. But um, I do have a question, and, and is, is that sector under a, have a quota that they have to achieve, or that it ever gets cut down when it's? Uh, for Blue Line, there is a private recreational, or a recreational quota. For Golden, there is not. So uh, an idea would probably be, I, I know enforcement, Put that burden on them. I mean, they already have a heavy burden now. But I think if you just said, looking at the reporting and just said the word uh, reallocate, then maybe perhaps you start reporting. Scott, you had a follow up. Yeah, quickly. I think, in, at least in our area, we're sending out our from an ocean city, the tilefish um, tile fleet is. A lot of the HMS fleet, and I think some of these guys get their tile fish permits because they're anticipating—not anticipating, but they're um, wondering what the tuna fish season will be like the following year. Because when we have a bad tuna season, blue line tile fish harvest goes up, 
um, just because folks switch their attention from tuna fish that aren't around to something that they can catch. So charter boats will start to target them on a regular basis uh, if tuna fishing is not very good. So um, they, they, know that they know that they need to report the HMS stuff. If we start making them feel like they have to report the um, tile fish stuff, I think we'll start to see a change. Thank you. Adam Nawalski. So for those that weren't here yesterday for the executive committee meeting on the implementation plan for 2024, the draft plan started out with outreach. There were a number of us around the table who said outreach is insufficient. We need something more comprehensive than that. Uh, I think most all of the ideas that were talked about around the table today came up yesterday. Uh, so what I would recommend everyone is tune back in in December uh, when the full council votes on an implementation plan. Hopefully everyone will support the item that was recommended yesterday to work on this in 2024, not just as outreach, but to do a lot of the things that were talked about here today, committee meetings, working with law enforcement, et cetera, deciding what carrots or what sticks are gonna be needed to get people to report. We know there's a lot of permits out there. We know reporting's not taking place. Uh, this isn't, we know this is what's happening. Um, and based on the outcome from yesterday, we have something that's planned for 2024 to work on this. And I think everyone will be able to support that very easily um, when that comes back to us to a full council in December. Bobby Rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to do a, agree with a point that was made earlier, and I think it's something we may want to consider. Um, if we float the idea of possible sector se sector separation uh, between party charter and, uh, and and private recreational, I think you'll probably see a lot more uh, compulsory reporting. Um, based, you know, using that as your guideline for for your initial allocations, I think you'll see. Uh, I think it would be a useful way to kind of drive them to report a little bit better. Chris, I think you've had your hand up to probably answer a question from earlier. Yeah, I was just going to chime in and say, you know, um, I like to deer hunt and I know, um, you know, one issue deer biologists have is, is similar to this where, you know, you have folks that are supposed to report deer that are harvested and they use that in their population modeling. But, you know, they know that no level, you know, I mean, that's the issue there too, is that there's, there's, just a low, low enforcement, not enough EPOs out there, but they also know that you're never going to, you know, you're never going to scare everyone into, into reporting. Um, so, you know, they have methods where they, you know, can actually estimate these reporting rates and they know it differs by geographic area and they know it's lower with does and higher with bucks. Um, you know, I'd have to dig into the literature a little more, but I think, you know, I think there are approaches that are out there that, you know, to allow you to estimate some of these reporting rates, you know, knowing that you're never, you know, you're never going to get to that 100% of people getting a permit, 100% of people reporting every trip, you know, reporting every fish on every trip. And maybe there's, you know, there's approaches from the fishery world or, you know, from other worlds where you could, you could use to tackle this issue, I think. Um, and I just want to make one last point is that, you know, I think this information we are getting number of fish caught and all that information that we record on the BTR. I mean, I think there is, you know, I think that's still important information. Um, and I think, you know, we can use that information to, to look at trends and changes through time. We just have to be careful and, you know, realize that that's not, you know, a hundred percent of the fish that are being caught and a hundred percent of the trips being taken and just keep that in mind. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my last comment. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Is there anything else, Anna, Jose, need to bring up? Greg, you have a comment? Greg DiDomenico, Lunch Fisheries. It's just one question and one comment uh, for Chris. Chris, when you look at the when you look at the database that you've been that you you have access to, can you? look at the entire suite of permits 
that someone with a blue line tile recreational permit has, because there's definitely a link between uh, the HMS fishery and this fishery. Are you capable of doing that? Sorry, you, you broke up on me for most of that. Well, I'm sorry. Can you look at your database and determine whether or not someone with a blue line tile recreational permit also has an HMS permit? Yeah, I think so. I think it might be in a different database, those HMS permits, but I think that's something we could dig into. Okay, thank you. And just one suggestion, I think after hearing a lot of the comments, this is the perfect opportunity for, for the Mid-Atlantic Council to tell or to request to the HMS uh, division while they're contemplating all their new reporting requirements to add blue line and yellow and, and golden tile to the reporting requirements. We know the link is there. We know the overlap is there. So why not have some, why not have HMS do it? Thank you. Ms. Laurie Nolan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this was a lot of information, way more than I was expecting to see, to be honest. Um, and I'm a little surprised, but um, just to touch on a couple of the slides, like slide 13, I, I don't think we should be looking at this um, as if it's worth nothing necessarily. And I do think there are certain trends that could be teased out and understood a little better if, like people have said around the table, how was tuna fishing that year? How's the fuel price that year? How's the weather that year? Because, you know, this is not a fishery that's happening off the beach, off the docks, inshore. You know, this is a, a 50 to 100 mile trip just to go catch them. We keep talking on all of this data, it's tilefish trips, but there doesn't seem to be any separation in all of this information between blue lines and goldens. So that would be a question I have. Is this just total, all these numbers that we're looking at on all these slides are both the golden and tilefish? And if so, I would think we would wanna separate the data somehow to, to tease out what's going on in tilefish golden land and tilefish blue line land. Um, and when the tuna fishing is good, you don't have the effort. So if you see the trend go down in 13, instead of on slide 13, instead of thinking necessarily that, oh, nobody's reporting, oh, we're not getting the information, like everyone is saying, maybe they need to fill out a did not fish trip, but the reality is they didn't target it because tuna fishing was so good. So to me, there's just a lot of other variables that come into play before we should be assuming we got a bunch of guilty um, recreational people out there who aren't reporting. And I wasn't going to talk about the large pelagic survey because I didn't think it was going to be part of this presentation, but Jose brought it up. And, you know, the idea that suddenly a large pelagic survey is going to become, um, you know, the gospel on how many golden tilefish or blue line tilefish are landed by the recreational sector. You've got all the, all the language that's attached to the description of the large pelagic survey you know, it talks about tunas, it talks about swordfish, it, it talks about mahi, it talks about species that have apps, nowhere in it does it say golden tilefish or blue line tilefish. And, and um, going through the research track assessment process, you know, this, the results of the large pelagic survey came to the table on goldens. And as Jose said, you know, there appears to be so many more fish being landed based on that survey compared to the mandatory reporting survey. And I get it, there is a huge spread, but I just don't think it's fair to take the numbers out of a large pelagic survey that's um, focusing on tournament towns, you know, that's, that's what drives their um, sampling, that's what puts them on the docks, you know, all the tournaments and stuff that the recreational sector holds. You know, what does that have to do with tile fishing? And 
I'm, I'm fearful that somehow this large pelagic survey is going to step in and suddenly drive the catch on the goldens and the blue lines. And that could be a completely inflated number. So I would like to see, I'm very happy to hear you guys talking about a meeting. The tilefish group are going to get together. The committee will get together, hash some of this out and, and figure out where to go from here to maybe turn this pilot program into something more effective. You know, law enforcement, I think, has to start to play a part here, um, as everyone has commented on. But I'm just very leery to have suddenly the large pelagic survey um, be the indicator or the, as I say, the gospel on how many tilefish have been landed in a given year, because that survey is not designed um, for goldens or blue lines. It's designed for the highly migratory. And I don't think it's fair to, to suddenly take this on as the be all end all answer to how many fish are being landed in the recreational fishery. And I'm sorry you guys are in New York on such a beautiful day. I wish you could have gotten further east. And I'm glad you're not here last week because it was pouring rain. And it's nice to hear everyone talking. And thank you for letting me say what I said. Dan, I'm going to give you the final word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> you know, hearing everybody around the table talk, did I hear that there's a 24 hour, I don't know this, is there a 24 hour window you have to report after you actually land? So we can start with that. I mean, I hate to keep saying this, but on the commercial side, you had to have the VTR filled out before you hit the dock. Why not start with that? You need to have your VTR filled out before you hit the dock. That way, if, if you're boarded, you're in violation. You haven't, you haven't given done it properly. Just something to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. With that, Chris, thank you very much. Han and Jose, thank you. Jose. I just have a, a quick question. So uh, there have been a discussion regarding the 24 hour uh, window. We're going to have a meeting, uh, hopefully, with law enforcement, and with uh, Health Fish Committee, and, and the AP, and some other people, and talk about a potential way to address this. And my question is let's say that they indicate that, yeah, it might be a very effective tool to uh, ask uh, fishermen to report their landings when they come to shore. If that was the case, do, uh, and this is a question for the service, do, do we have to write a document to do that? Since we already did it in the original amendment, that's something that can be uh, changed through uh, your internal uh, rules. Mike. So the 24 hour reporting window was part of the council's action recommendation for the private file fish permit and reporting program. So, yeah, I would think if the council's interested in changing that, that would need to come through the council process. And just, I guess, while I have the floor on that issue, I think if the council is going to go down that road. It, Useful to understand a rationale for why private anglers have would have to report less than 24 hours, but for higher permit holders don't. Right? I mean, we went around and around on whether 48 hours was too quick to require for higher permit holders to report at the end of a trip. We went to 24 for private anglers. And now we're thinking about going to even less time for private anglers. Yet no one's talking about the for higher permit holders. Right, this is something I think we're going to have to cross at a future date. With that, thank you. Let's move on to our next agenda item. Habitat activities update. Uh, we're going to have a presentation by Karen Green and Sue Tuxbury. Are you guys online? Are you ready to go? Yes, we are. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Uh, your slides up whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um. Good afternoon, everyone. It's it's really great to be here. 
I'm Karen Green. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Branch Chief for the Habitat and Ecosystem Services Division. And this is our um, semi-annual update to the Council on activities that you all wanted to hear about from us. So I'll talk a little bit and then Sue Tuxbury will follow me with offshore wind. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the infrastructure projects that we're working on, um, including coastal storm risk management, port development, and a, a little uh, bit about our national climate guidance. And then Sue will come on after me. She is our regional offshore wind coordinator, and she'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in our offshore wind world. Um, the next slide. Okay, so habitat infrastructure. Yep. So to start, we have a couple of updates on some US Army Corps of Engineers coastal storm risk management studies. And we, we put the links up in the slides um, in case any of you guys want to just poke around on their websites and, and find some additional information um, about what's going on with those studies. Um, the first one um, is the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study that we've previously uh, reported to you all on. Um, this one is being undertaken by the New York District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the tentatively selected plan for this study includes storm surge barriers and complementary shore-based measures across 12 basins within the New York and New Jersey Harbor area. And that's generally 12 miles, a circle 12 miles around the Statue of Liberty. Um, the shore-based measures can include a variety of structural features, um, such as flood walls, levees, elevated promenades, buried seawalls and dunes, revetments, berms, bulkheads, um, pedestrian ve vehicular gates, and road raise raisings. Um, the Army Corps hasn't provided feedback on our technical assistance comments that we provided them earlier in the year, but in a recent interagency meeting, they requested some feedback on the proposed course of action for study completion. Five alternatives were presented in varying um, between completing the study with the same timeline, which was approximately eight years, um, and funding what they currently have, which would leave no room for additional studies or questions to be answered. So the, the larger study includes you know, a variety of big things, storm gates, barriers, all kinds of things. And you know, one path is to kind of move ahead with that big study, and the other is to peel off smaller things that can be done earlier. A decision is anticipated to be made uh, by November on the path forward for this study. Another update is to the Raritan Bay, Sandy Hook Bay, New Jersey Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study. And this one is being undertaken by the Norfolk District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on behalf of the New York District. They kind of spread the workload out. Um, we don't have really too much new information on this one, um, and there haven't been any real um, additional informational meetings with them or interagency meetings. But we were told that the study has been expanded to include neighboring towns, including Keyport and Belford, in addition to Keensburg, East Keensburg, Lawrence Harbor, and Cliftwood Beach. So they're really just making that study area bigger. Um, many of these projects had studies that were started 20, 25 years ago. So this is an update to look at how they can protect these coastal communities along the Raritan Bay Shore. The newest project that has been proposed is the um, from the New York District is the Atlantic Coast of New York South Shore of Long Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study. This one is funded by the Disaster Relief Supplemental Appropriations of 2022. The New York Department of Environmental Conservation is the non-federal sponsor, and the study area extends from Coney Island to Montauk Point, including the barrier islands and back bays. This one overlaps with a number of existing studies, such as the Nassau County Back Bay Study, the Fire Island to Montauk Point Study, and the intent of this new larger study is to identify a systems approach to a more efficient and effective use of the sediments in coastal environments, uh, including you know, identifying new sand sources for beach nourishment, beneficially reusing dredge material, 
and, and habitat restoration opportunities. The study will focus on the Jones Beach Island because there is no ongoing study or authorized project there. Um, and the regional sediment management is not part of the study, but it will be used to inform the, the opportunities to uh, restore habitat. The project will not supersede the Fire Island study or existing projects, but will seek to instead optimize dredging and identify areas that could use more protection, such as the back bays. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's kind of the, the more northern studies, and now we'll move down a little bit further south. Um, the New Jersey Back Bay study has been around for a while. I think many of you um, have heard of it, and we've presented on it in the past. The Philadelphia District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is now working to extend the study timeline for this project. So like the Harbor and Tributary study, this one is really kind of a complex, large project because it runs from Monmouth County, New Jersey, all the way down to Cape May. Um, it's likely that we'll see a supplemental draft EIS um, next spring, but they haven't set up a firm date yet. They're also, like the Harbor and Tributary study, reevaluating the path forward um, and looking at what elements of their tentatively selected plan can move forward now with the information that they have and what need further study. Um, I don't know if you all remember, but this one includes storm gates across some of the inlets, um, including Manasquan and Ebsekin and um, Barnegat. And it has some barriers, uh, cross bay barriers associated with it. So those elements of this study will likely be held off for the future, you know, as more information gets collected on the effects of those types of structures and some of the the other elements of the plan may move forward things that they consider kind of non-structural which include elevating structures and um, more on the ground upland flood protection opportunities a more recent study is the delaware inland bays and delaware bay coastal storm risk management study it's a it's a pretty new one. The cost share agreement or the non federal sponsor in this one is the Delaware Department of um, Natural Resources. And so far, all that's been really completed on this study is scoping. So they looked at the, the study area. And looked at some of the issues and problems, and they've revised the scope. So now, rather than looking at both the Delaware Bay and the Delaware inland bays, this study is now going to focus on the inland bay area which includes Rehoboth Bay, Indian River Bay, and Little Assawoman Bay. Um, so we don't have much more information on the next steps yet. Right now, the Army Corps of Engineers is in phase two, which is looking at the different alternatives and analyzing the options and then coming up with a tentatively selected plan. Um, that's expected to happen between now and March of next year. And then they'll look at reviewing the plan once they've selected it, and then they'll come up with a draft EIS out for public review. Uh, the, the final study that we have to talk about a little bit today is the Virginia Beach Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study. This study began um, in July of 2022, and it's expected to take about four years. The city of Virginia Beach is the cost share partner on this, and we don't really have a whole lot of additional information on this. There was some early informational meetings. Um, scoping was done in 2022. A draft report is scheduled to be released late 2024. And that's about what we have on the coastal storm risk management studies. Next slide, please. So in addition to those types of studies that the Army Corps of Engineers is doing, we have two um, pretty large port development projects being proposed now, and both of these are associated with offshore wind. Neither of them are directly connected to a particular wind project. They're both projects that are being built by others and will lease space to various offshore wind developers. The first project that we have is the Arthur Kill Terminal, and that's located on the southwest side of Staten Island, just south of the Outer Bridge Crossing. This project was awarded a Port Infrastructure Development Program grant from 
uh, MARAD, the U.S. Maritime Administration, and they're the lead federal agency for the development of all of the national environmental policy documents. Um, the project sponsor of this one is a private entity, so it's a, a private developer that is building this. It's a brand new proposed port. Um, it's not a rehabilitation or an expansion of its existing facility. And it includes right now um, some pretty significant work on the site because the site's basically undeveloped. So we're looking at now about 18 acres or more of dredging and almost 10 acres of, of fill in the Arthur Kill. Um, they're also looking at developing a fish exclusion type structure around the work area so that they um, are proposing not to use the, the typical time of year restrictions that are often recommended for migrating fish or winter flounder in the area. The agencies are, are working now with the developer and, and MARAD um, on mitigation opportunities, compensatory mitigation to offset the effects of the fill and the dredging in the project location. So far, a public notice from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has not yet been issued for this one, um, and we haven't seen any formal NEPA documents. So we're still in the discussion phases on this project. Um, the other project that we have is the New Jersey Wind Port, and that one is located in Lower Alloway Creek Township in Salem County, New Jersey, and it's on the Delaware River. And it's right next to the Salem Nuclear Power Plant. Um, this one is being sponsored by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, and there's a phase one that's already permitted under construction. So phase two is an expansion of this facility to add more space for berthing and manufacturing uh, and, and more lease space for other developers. Um, this, this new second phase includes about 200 million cubic yards of dredging, oh, 400 million cubic yards of dredging, and another 200,000 cubic yards dredged annually over um, 100 acres. What we're looking at right now with this project is the beneficial use opportunities for all of this dredge material. And that includes right now um, a proposal to create wetlands along the Delaware Bay shore south of the site, as well as some, as some um, more novel idea to dispose of the material just offshore of some existing wetlands at Mad Horse Creek with the idea that the material will move into the marsh on its own. It's kind of an untested um, method. So we have some concerns about that. But again, you know, we're working with the developer, we're working with the US Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA and the Fish and Wildlife Service as we review these projects. This one also doesn't have a public notice out yet. Um, we'll certainly let Council staff know when these come out in case you are all interested in, in chiming in on these. Um, and I included the links to the different websites. If you wanted to explore more information about those projects. Next slide, please. All right, this veers a little bit off of projects and it's just to let everyone know that, um, the EFH program in, uh. Office of Habitat Conservation and the, the different regions have developed a national climate consultation guidance. On the GARFO side, we already have guidance that we developed in 2018-19 that's actually posted on the, the GARFO policy uh, website, but this is now a national guidance and it provides information to action agencies and councils and our biologists on how to incorporate the expected change climate change effects into consultations and assessments and it includes as you can see from the slide identifying ways that climate change may interact with an action in the assessments identifying time periods for projecting anticipated climate change effects in efh assessments we don't really consider it in minor projects like if you're building a dock in your backyard climate change really isn't coming into consideration when that gets reviewed, but for some of these large port facilities or these coastal storm risk management studies, we really want to think about, you know, the conditions that we're seeing now and in the future and how those interact with the EFH assessment and the proposed action. 
Um, we have guidance on selecting the climate change emission scenario for the assessments, identifying design considerations and min minimization measures, and you know, developing our, our conservation recommendations. So at the bottom of the slide, you really can't see it all that well. I apologize. That's a link to where we have this guidance as well as any other kind of guidance that our um, national program has put out. So, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sue Tuxbury, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the offshore wind world in the habitat. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, Sue Tuxbury, I'm the offshore wind program coordinator for the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office, and I'm going to give you an update on um, some of our offshore wind activities and habitat. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So we are, um, NOAA Fisheries is proposing a habitat area of particular concern within and around the Southern New England um, wind lease areas, which is inclusive of Cox Ledge. Um, this is uh, HEPCs for complex bottom habitats, as well as cod spawning areas within this um, area you see in red, um, which is inclusive of the proposed HEPC designation. Um, so NOAA, so um, the, this, this HAPC was um, voted on and approved last summer by the, the New England Fisheries Management Council. Um, we, we issued the proposed rule on September 26th and the public comment, it's open for public comments and um, the, the period is closing on um, October 26th. Um, the purpose of the HAPCs is to provide additional conservation focus um, when NOAA Fisheries reviews and comments on any federal or state action um, within an HA that could impact um, EFH. So an EF um, HAPC designation, it doesn't provide any specific um, habitat management measures, such as restrictions on any activities um, associated in this area, including offshore wind or, or fishing activity. Um, HAPCs provide, really provide a clear um, indication of the value that NOAA Fisheries and the Council places on specific habitat types and functions, and it underscores uh, recommendations to protect those habitats from impacts. The recent studies in this area are showing the importance of this area for Atlantic cod spawning, um, and there's a number of um, complex habitats associated with Cox Ledge in this area. And these, these types of habitats are, are more vulnerable um, to impacts from, from offshore wind development and other activities. Um, so there, the framework is um, will adjust the following uh, fisheries management plans, the Northeast multi-species, Atlantic sea scallop, monkfish, Northeast skate complex, and Atlantic herring um, FMPs. There's no change changes to the um, any proposed commercial or recreational management measures with this. And again, the comment period closes on October 26. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you an update on where we are with some of the EFH consultations for offshore wind. Um, we've completed three consultations, Ocean Wind 1, Revolution Wind, and Seabow. Um, we've also issued EFH conservation recommendations for Sunrise Wind and Empire Wind, and we are awaiting BOEM's formal response to those recommendations. Um, we are currently um, preparing EFH conservation recommendations for Atlantic Shore South and New England Wind. Um, we recently received an updated draft EFH assessment um, for U.S. Wind Maryland, and we're reviewing that now. Um, that pro th that consultation is um, currently scheduled to be initiated in December. Um, we also have a draft DFH assessment for South Coast. Um, that schedule is changing and we have we don't yet have a new, new schedule for when we anticipate that consultation to be initiated. Next slide, please. So um, BOEM identified three wind energy areas this summer in the Central Atlantic. Um, the areas, including the coral protection area and the offshore areas, were not put forward at this time. Um, BOEM did issue a notice of intent to prepare an environmental assessment for site assessment activities and site characterization activities associated with um, leasing of these wind energy areas. Um, there is a task force meeting planned for October 10th for the Central Atlantic that is open to the public. 
Um, BOEM is also preparing a programmatic EIS um, for the six uh, New York Bite lease areas that's expected to be published in early 2024. Um, as a cooperating agency, we just recently reviewed a, the, a draft of that programmatic and provided um, BOEM with comments in early September. Um, BOEM is also preparing a programmatic EFH assessment, which would include the New York, the six New York bite leases, as well as other mid-Atlantic projects. Um, we are reviewing that draft now. Um, this would, we would still expect there would still need to be um, supplemental uh, um, project specific consultations that would tear off any programmatic um, for this. Um, and then additionally, we've begun some early coordination with developers largely focused on benthic surveys, um, but also in some cases discussing um, cable routing with some of the projects. Next slide, please. Um, so US Win Maryland, the draft EIS um, is expected to be published in the Federal Register on October 6th, so this, um, this Friday. Um, it is currently available on BOEM's website. Um, this is a 45-day public comment period, so comments would be due on November 20th. Um, Kitty Hawk North, um, BOEM has provided us with a draft ESA biological assessment and anticipates providing us with a draft EFH assessment this December. This project is being handled by our Southeast Regional Office. Um, and they anticipate completing the consultations for this project in the fall of 2024. Um, and um, lastly, we also, I just wanna note, um, we've worked with both BOEM and our Southeast Regional Office to develop a template for EFH assessments. This is really intended to ensure that we have consistency across the documents we receive. Um, and this, this has been, um, we posted this recently on our technical guidance, our GARPA WIND web, web page, which includes um, the te technical guidance page that can be found at the link there. Uh, next slide. And that, that's all I have. So if you have any, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Any questions for Karen or Sue? Comments for Karen or Sue? Seeing none around the table. I'm going to go to the webinar. Julie Evans. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question for the um, Arthur Kill project. Um, uh, I believe it's a dredging project. So the, the speaker mentioned, um, has the um, dredge spoil been tested um, for any contaminated sediments? Because I do believe there are some Superfund sites in that area. Long ago, we were um, very concerned about Agent Orange dioxin, um, PAHs, PCBs, heavy metals, arsenic, and the dredge spoils in that area. We'd hate to see, um, you know, we're all trying to save the environment. Um, having it put on productive fishing grounds anywhere in the New York Bight might really be bad. Could somebody comment on that, please? Sure. And this is Karen Green. Yes, the material has been tested. So there's testing protocols that every dredging project has to follow and and they're usually driven by the state um, but they're also um, epa also oversees those so any project that happens within the state of new york has to follow specific protocols and they would have to be disposed of in a manner that's approved by the state of new york and they're usually very strict on you know what gets tested how it gets tested and where it can go um, and there's also conditions depending on the level of contamination on what type of equipment that you can use and how, you know, the lift speed of a dredge. So to minimize the release of contaminants in the waterway. So you said the material has already been tested. What was it tested for? Off the top of my head, I can't tell you exactly what they test for, but there is a whole suite of contaminants that it gets tested for. So there's a, a list. 
and there's a protocol that includes usually it includes um, bioaccumulation tests and toxicity tests. So they would be testing for things like PCBs, the components of Agent Orange, you know, the dioxins, metals, all of those things, um, pesticides. It's it's a whole pretty comprehensive suite of things that get tested. Would it be difficult to supply me and the rest of my New Yorker fishermen friends um, with a, a complete list of what was tested, what what appeared, and the levels that are allowable for dumping in the ocean. We we were very much involved in the mud dump site years ago, um, which was like a toxic. They created a tox, toxic dump site at the mud dump. If you know that fishing area, probably yeah. Tony Delorio knows it. Um, and um, you know it it was a, a long battle, and we ended up winning the court bit boy. Um, um, the court yes. uh, case, yeah, it was it was quite uh, quite it was quite lovely actually in the end because they were ready to dump, and we stopped. So, so those those resources and that information would be available, um, not from us because NOAA Fisheries we don't have that information. It would be we might see it as part of a permit application, but you'd have to reach out to the state of New York Department of Environmental Conservation, and or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or EPA. So the best point of contact would really be the folks in the state of New York and their permitting entities because they would have it's it's their regulations that get followed. Even though it's in New Jersey. Oh, the Arthur Kill project is in New York. It's on Staten Island. Oh, it's on Staten Island. Yes. Oh, you mean it's at the, the dump site in Staten Island? It the is Arthur actually, Kill? The the Arthur Kill oh. site is located on the south. West side of Staten Island, yeah. just south of the Outer Bridge Crossing Bridge. <laughs> I, I know where it is. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Wilkie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Sue. Uh, it's related to the New Southern New England HAPC designation. And I'm just curious, given the impending designation, has there been discussion around um, conducting trawl surveys? in those areas um, to track changes in fish abundance? So, yeah, um, not as part of the of the HAPC designation. Um, the HAPC, de it, it essentially designates the area of an HAPC, and it's really the areas where there is complex habitat and where there is cod spawning activity. And we have some recent studies showing areas that where cod spawning activity is occurring, but the entire area hasn't been, um, this entire area hasn't been fully, um, fully evaluated. Um, uh, but, but we wouldn't do trawl surveys as part of, uh, as the part of the designation. Um, uh, we're, we're issuing this in response to, um, the recommendations by the New England Fisheries Management Council. I, there are surveys that are in like happening as part of the, um, the offshore wind projects, but that's not part of the HAPC um, proposed rule. Right, and so that's my, that's actually my question, probably I didn't word it right, um, but how would that, the designation as an HAPC influence the environmental review related to those trawl surveys? Yeah, so it, for, so it doesn't limit any ongoing activity. It's really, um, it's really kind of a, a it, it really just focuses on the value of those areas. So if we were reviewing, um, you know, um, reviewing the project or even reviewing um, applications for um, any type, any type of surveys in the area, um, this it would really just provide additional focus for implementing kind of recommendations um, to reduce impacts, but it wouldn't change, you know, again, and we, we offer recommendations to um, whoever the federal action agency, in this case, for offshore wind construction, it's BOEM, um, but BOEM does not necessarily have to take those recommendations, um, and that does not change with the HAPC designation. Does that 
yeah answer yeah, your question you. yeah so so essentially it wouldn't change whether or not those surveys could occur um it would just kind of be focusing on it it really kind of puts a focus on the importance of those habitats and um you know it kind of stresses the importance of of reducing impacts to those habitats and and hopefully um can it help ensure that some more of the recommendations to, to reduce impacts for activities in those areas are um, considered and, and ideally implemented, but it doesn't require them to be. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bonnie Brady. Hey, Wes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Bonnie Brady, Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. Um, I have a question regarding, and I'm not sure if this would be um, Ms. Tuxbury or not, regarding certain types of terrain that are considered habitat areas of particular concern. Is glacial moraine, I know in Rhode Island and Cox's Ledge, the, I know the Greg from Rhode Island themselves that talked about habitat areas of particular concern if it was in state waters. But is glacial moraine and or glacial till considered a habitat area of concern or purely EFH throughout, say, southern New England? Could anyone help me with that, please? Thank you. Hi, Bonnie. Yes, yeah, I, I can help answer that. Yeah, the state of Rhode Island uses the term glacial moraine. That That is in that does encompass complex habitats. We we use more of the the um, the CMEX substrate definition of um, greater than you know five percent gravels, um, pebbles, gravels, and cobbles. So, um, but yes, that that is the glacial moraine is considered complex habitat that would be considered part of the. Um, you know, and there's areas that are the glacial moraine is largely the, um, you know, really what's the large grain complex habitat, and there there may be additional areas that would also fit under complex habitat under the HAPC. Oh, right. Um, if I can just follow up, yeah, I know for Long Island there's apparently two ranges, and I know certain areas of the Sound have what they refer to as glacial till. I'm not sure if that would be considered complex or not, as opposed to sand waves, et cetera. I'm just trying to figure out is what things does NIMS qualify as being specifically habitat areas of concern versus just the straight up EFH in the southern New England range. Is there somewhere maybe you can send me an email afterward just to give me a clue? Thanks. Yes, I can do that. We actually put together um, recommendations for mapping EFH um, for mapping fish habitat for to BOEM to help supplement their um, benthic survey guidelines. And we do offer like specific definitions in there um, in terms of where what we identify as as considering to be complex. So okay. I can I, that I can that would be huge. That would be huge. I just want to point out for everybody else that might be listening as to why. Um, when you've got cables coming into certain landing spots as per purchase power agreements, um, the areas that they're coming in on may include things like sand waves and or glacial till and having an ability, whether or not your state believes that to be habitat or is a particular concern. But if you could hold up NIMS's choice of that, you might have a better opportunity for depending on who fishes where and how to perhaps microsite away from those areas. Thank you. This is Karen Green, and I do want to, you know, uh, follow up on Sue's answer with this, and I, and I want to clarify something because there is a distinction. A habitat area of particular concern is a subset of essential fish habitat that has a, a high value, is rare, um, particularly sensitive to human disturbance. It's a specifically identified area by the councils. So that is something the councils define um, and is, is a component of EFH. Separate from that, we do have habitats that we consider are important, and it can include a whole host of complex habitats as well as this, you know, the sand ridges and, and such, but they may not in and of themselves be 
a habitat area of particular concern, you know, right. under yes. the FH definition. So right. just to make that distinction, so the, the you know, the, the information that Sue presented on the new HAPC, the new proposed HAPC, can include those habitats, but it's not broadly across the region anything. No, no. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's with, it's within the red, it's complex habitats within the red um within that red within the proposed HAPC. Right. And, and no, I'm I'm not trying to add extra to it, but I know for certain state waters, similar types of habitats, it would be good to be able to reference these or those in federal waters. That's what I was getting at. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Karen and Sue, for the presentation. We're going to take a 10 minute break till four o'clock. And then we're going to do a hopefully a very quick version of the last four agenda items. So we're not here most of the night. Uh, with that, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Yeah. Hey, I just listened to your message twice now. Um, yeah, we all knew that. I don't know. I'm so involved in Zoom meetings. What, what did I tell you? I, Just about the wind, the wind farms going on to the continental shelf and how they kill us. And all that. Julie, we can hear your conversation. You may want to mute yourself. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to go with our next agenda item. Northeast Fishery Science Center Observer Program update from Catherine McArdle. Catherine, I don't want to rush you, but if you can make it short and sweet, that would be wonderful. We're way behind schedule. Yes, of course, I'll do my best. Um, so I'll jump right into it. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Katie McArdle, and I'm currently serving as the acting chief of the Fishery Monitoring and Research Division at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to present an update on the observer program today. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be going over kind of four major topics. Um, I'll just provide um, an overview of our mission and organizational structure. I will talk about the standard bycatch reporting methodology, also known as the SBRM. Um, this is what drives the observer task C days. Um, I'll provide an overview of our accomplishments, our coverage accomplishments for um, SBRM year 2022, and also how we've been doing for 2023. And um, I'll touch upon a few programmatic, programmatic updates as well. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. So as far as our division's mission goes, um, FMRD collects data and information from commercial fisheries in support of fisheries management and science. We strive to bring the fishermen's perspective into the federal process through collaboratively producing scientific information and also to be a trusted presence among the fishing, scientific, and management communities. Um, we are working on developing a strategic plan, which we'll be happy to share with the council um, 
further down the road. Next slide, please. So as I said, I'm the acting division chief right now. This is an overview of our division. We have four branches. Um, and we also have an admin team that's run by the deputy, Amy Martins. Um, I normally serve as the fisheries monitoring operations branch chief. Um, Nicole Rossi is acting while um, I'm in this position. We are recruiting for a new permanent division chief. So I will be serving in the acting division chief role until that's filled. Uh, Ryan Shama runs the training and data quality branch chief, Dr. Anna Mercer runs the cooperative research branch. Uh, she will be presenting after me. And then Josh Lee um, runs the data and information systems branch. Next slide, please. So this is a very brief overview kind of of what our branches do. Um, so just starting on the left-hand side here in, the, in blue, the fisheries monitoring operations branch is really to support observer at sea deployments. We work on, um, with the providers very, very closely and on any at sea um, observer emergencies. Our training and data quality branch focuses on data processing, QA, QC, data debriefing, and of course our training for observers. Cooperative research branch does a lot of research um, with directly with the industry and they have some long-term projects they've worked on like study fleet and bottom long line. And they also have some new projects as well, such as SWIBS. And, uh, Dr. Mercer will be talking about that next. And then our data and information system branch focuses on um, our data modernization, management, application development. And they're currently working on a project on data consolidation that I'll touch upon shortly. And then of course our admin team. Next slide, please. Um, so the standard bycatch reporting methodology, which I'll call the SBRM. So this slide is just a quick review of the SBRM omnibus amendment and its requirements. So due to data gaps from the pandemic, uh, no discard analysis was able to be completed in 2021 and 2022 as required by the SBRM amendment. The amendment does require us um, to do an annual discard report, which utilizes information obtained from our observer programs for 14 federally managed species groups and sea turtles. Each year, discard estimates and variability are derived from the prior year data to inform observer coverage needs. So this year we did do a full analysis for the first time since the pandemic. Next slide, please. The SBRM CD schedule rollout um, did occur on August 9th. So our SBRM year begins each year in April. So we did experience a delay there. Um, the team at the center, um, as well as our partners are working through different ways to improve the timeline for next year. So like I said, in 2023, the full discard analysis was able to be conducted. Um, the total C days needed according to the analysis was 6,926 C days. Of the 5,293 sea days needed for agency funded fleets, 300, excuse me, 3,373 days were able to be funded in 2023. 320 of those days were carry, carried over from 2022. And for the industry funded Scala fleet, um, approximately 1,600 days were determined to be needed and um, were able to be funded. Um, next slide, please. So um, kind of in terms of the Mid-Atlantic, um, one big change that we've seen over the, since the last several years um, is the Mid-Atlantic Small um, Mesh Bottom Autotrol Fleet. Um, so this was not subject to the prioritization process that, um, that is um, done within the SBRM due to the small difference between the two top species groups that were driving these C days. So this is the 1400 C days referenced here. Those were driven by small mesh ground fish and turtles and they were very similar. Hence, um, the full C days are what we are tasking um, from what the analysis called for. So um, even though this is an increase in the last several year, years, this coverage is in line with pre-COVID levels for the Mid-Atlantic Small Mesh Bottom Monotrol. So very similar to what we saw um, pre-pandemic. Um, some funding was also received this year to cover the Mid-Atlantic Gillnet Fleet that was relisted in the 2023 annual determination. These days were tasks specifically to help monitor for interactions with sea turtles. Um, so these days are typically occurring south of Long Island Sound. Um, this is similar to the Marine Mammal Protection Act coverage um, in which state only permitted and federally permitted vessels are eligible for coverage. And again, all of, because um, the um, SBRM was rolled out a little bit late, our outreach was delayed. Um, it did leave a little bit of confusion in terms of 
expectations of C days that needed to be accomplished. So permit holder letters were sent out in August and we had staff within the operations branch um, under the division in both the Mid-Atlantic and New England, they were able to hit the docks and do as much in-person outreach as possible in the month of September. Next slide, please. So the three-year SBRM review work is ongoing and on schedule. Uh, the technical memos drafts text is in progress. Um, in the beginning of the SBRM 2024 work is approaching. So that year begins April 1st, 2024. We technically kind of kick off our work in order to support that on October 1st of 2023. So we're just beginning that right now. Um, in the 2024 SBRM year, the estimated bycatch of sea turtles in the bottom trawl gear will be updated. Um, this analysis is done by our protected species branch. Next slide, please. So for our um, 2023 NEFOP coverage, so again, this is our coverage beginning May 1st, 2023. Um, it has been going well, despite the delays to the rollout of the 2023 sea day schedule. So the first quarter of the, the year, which we consider April through June, um, we've had had some shortfalls in the Mid-Atlantic, small mesh bottom motor trawl. Um, again, this is about the 1500 days that are tasked. So far, we have about 65% of those task days completed. Um, the uh, Dated Species Act, Mineral Protection Act days, so protected species days um, in the Mid-Atlantic, we are averaging at about 73% um, of a realized coverage rate and with a little bit lower of um, realized coverage rate in the ESA over the MMPA dates. In the second quarter of the year, so that begins in our SBRM year in September, um, we don't quite have a final tally of the days. That takes um, several weeks as the data come into TDQ, training and data quality for the QAQC process, but we'll have updates on that shortly. And we did notice that um, the high water temperatures have suppressed some of the typical gillnet effort. So we were seeing a decrease in the gillnet effort in the mid-Atlantic, um, but we did see some cooler waters brought in by Hurricane Lee. Um, so the provider has communicated to us that they're hoping to make up some ground in their MMPA ESA coverage as effort picks back up. Uh, next slide, please. As far as ground fish and industry funded scallops, so our Etsy monitoring coverage target rate for this ground fish fishing year, which began May 1st, 2023 is 90%. That is up from 80% last year. And our realized coverage is currently as of a couple of weeks ago, um, 83%. So that's an average over 11 sectors that can range, that ranges anywhere from 63 to 98%, depending on the sector. Some of the challenges in full coverage achievements include um, potential communication challenges between observers and vessel operators, um, inadequate at sea monitors in certain areas that are difficult to get to. And with the ground fish fishery specifically, there is a notification requirement in which the ground fish fleet needs to call us or notify us 48 hours in advance of fishing. Um, generally speaking, that tends to be very good, but we do sometimes um, have non-compliance issues. Therefore, the inability to assign an observer if they don't notify us. Industry-funded scallop is on track to meet our limited access target coverage. So we're at 85% of the target currently. Our general category coverage is a little bit low. Um, we did notice that the fishing effort is lower by about 100 trips per month compared to previous years. Um, scallop trawl has generally been difficult for us to achieve due to the, the lack of available observers um, to cover the gear type, lack of trips, and where the trips are located. Next slide, please. And so for 2022, our SBRM year, again, this runs May, uh, excuse me, April 1st, 2022 to March 31st, 2023. Um, we ended the year with 98% of our task sea days completed. Um, our Marine Mammal Protection coverage in the Mid-Atlantic and PTNS fleets in the Mid-Atlantic both had a little bit of lower accomplishments for, the, for that year. Um, our industry funded scallop coverage in fishing year 2022 completed 93 percent of the target coverage in our general category was a little bit more challenging. and We finished that year off with a 62% realized coverage. Um, like I said, the ground fish coverage was set at 80% and we were able to hit 59% coverage, which we considered to be somewhat of a success because we were still coming out of the pandemic and trying to increase our, our number of trainings and observer cadre in order to hit that fleet at the required um, coverage level. Next slide, please. 
So for programmatic updates, um, one major change we did this year is we did a pretty major contract modification. So we have a contract with one provider, AIS, who it's a five-year contract, and they um, basically run the C-day schedule in order to achieve the days that we have um, that are non-IFS. There are There is some IFS, excuse me, for SVRM, and there is some MIFOP groundfish coverage, but for the most part, they're achieving a lot of our um, days. And so um, the observer program had additional funds left on that contract due to COVID-19 impacts, <clears throat> excuse me, to deployments. So in order to ensure that those funds could be fully utilized, um, we did do a contract extension and we pursued that with several major contract modifications. So those contract modifications went into effect on June 8th and we really kind of strived um, those modifications in order to help improve observer retention, increase C day accomplishments, improve observer report sy support systems, and update practices. So, briefly going over those modifications, we did um, see an increase in our observer C day rates, the overtime rates, and our hourly rates. Um, we, for observers that were soliciting uh, trips at the dock, um, we are reimbursing them for that time, opposed to that being needed loaded into a sea day rate. Um, that is important because in the mid-Atlantic, we don't have call-in systems or notification systems like we do in the Northeast for a lot of our fisheries. And we also were requesting um, more real-time field work summaries in order to monitor our achievements and challenges. We provided professional development opportunities, and we really wanted to focus on our recruitment and retention practices and plans so we did want to have kind of greater incentives in there for longer term employment. Um, we also established roundtable meetings. This was really in order to improve and um, enhance the relationship, the in-person relationship between observers and our Office of Law Enforcement, as well as our staff to make them more, make us more approachable for observers to be able to communicate about any um, uh, events that they wanted to notify us from at sea. And then just as an update, our police life raft, this did get rolled out in June, but we are no longer providing extra rafts for deployments. Next slide, please. So observer attrition, um, this has continued to be a challenge at the observer program. So in most years since the pandemic, um, you can see kind of on the left table there, the number of observers trained each year closely matches the number of observers who've exited. Um, so con we did contract our out or at sea monitoring training. So we have a grant with Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission, and they work directly with Kunamisset Farm Foundation just to kind of farm out that specific training. So we work collaboratively with CFF in order to make sure they're meeting all of our uh, training uh, requirements. Um, but this really has um, increased our program's capacity to rebound after the pandemic and come close to achieving um, the new ground fish target coverage rate, which is, like I said, is 90%. And while the NEFOP contract modifications are still new, we are really tracking this closely, our retention rates and our training rates. So the training outcomes from IFS and NEFOP in 2022, as well as the annual observer retention survey, so we do this yearly, um, indicate that retention rates could be improving. You'll note that 45% of our observers said they um, intended to stay in the program for only a year in 2022, whereas that number has increased in 2023 to 57%. I imagine that's probably due to some of our contract modifications that we made. And we are starting to see a slow increase in our uh, retention rates from six to eight months. Next slide, please. So with a lower retention rate for observers, um, we do we have noted that 35% of our observer cadre does have more than one year of experience as an observer in the Northeast. So on this table, you'll see the, the kind of the blue line. Um, it correlates directly, if you look at the left, 110 observers that we have and the number of years of experience that they have under their belt. So as you progress through the duration of their career, you'll notice there's a lot less observers that are still with the program. Um, I will note that we do have about five observers who have been with the program for a decade or more. So we're hoping that this blue line will kind of shift to the right a little bit and we start to see observers stay with the program a little bit um, longer than they currently are. Next slide, please. Um, so um, Kunamisset Farm Foundation, I mentioned, is running our at-sea monitoring training and they've partnered with 
with us and, and they're working directly under a grant and contract with ASMFC. They've completed 13 ASM trainings so far and we just extended our, our, um, our work with them with CFF through June of 2024. Um, so this is really gonna allow our training and data quality training staff to focus on our other trainings, our NEFOP, industry-funded Scala, our recertifications and training development. Um, the first maximized retention electronic monitoring um, training. So this is an operational EM program. Um, we're conducted this year. We've already incorporated our audit operational EM training. Um, and recertification trainings are required for two of our programs. We paused those due to the pandemic and we are going planning on bringing those back this fall. Next slide, please. So um, these graphs just basically show you kind of our training outputs by program. So if you focus on the left table there, uh, our graph in 2023 to date and projected, it shows you basically how many people we expect to go through each program. So EM being the smallest, ASM being um, the largest, and with IFS and NEFOP falling somewhere in between. The right graph here shows you, uh, our table shows you um, our initial trainings and unutilized seats. So if you're a member under our contract modifications, we are trying to really push the recruitment. Um, I do think the providers have been doing an outstanding job with their recruitment strategies, um, but certainly this it's become an issue since the pandemic where there's really been an uptick in observers committing to training and then dropping out at the last minute. Um, so in order to try to deal with this, we're working the, with the providers to ensure that they're capitalizing on the offered training opportunities and not wasting training resources. We're trying to identify ideal times to hold trainings like, um, like after people graduate from college, um, opposed to during school times. We're, we're, we are reviewing and providing input on recruitment strategies. And then we're just updating our seat allocation process in order to make sure we're maximizing the number of seats across providers. So we're trying to provide increased stability in our training schedule to allow for longer term recruitment planning, um, but we have to obviously remain flexible enough to modify as new information and days are tasked to us. Next slide, please. So um, our data review update. So all of our data that we send through our program, um, it is our um, goal to have that data made available to end users within 90 days from when that month ends. So this blue line represents kind of that 90 day deadline that we have. And you'll notice in 2021, we really fell behind that deadline. I think I might have reported this out to the council last year. Um, we have developed um, kind of different strategies to, to deal with that. And one of them is an optimized review process, which allows us to be more efficient um, with our data processing. Um, also, um, we did have a large amount of internal staff attrition, which led to that initial um, kind of delay in data turnaround time. Um, for the most part, we're doing really well, and we do not anticipate any delays to impact the 2024 SBRM cycle. Um, next slide, please. And this is just to touch upon a little bit what our data and information systems branch is doing. So since 1989, when the observer program started, data collection processes and deliverables have greatly expanded. So in order to modernize our systems, there really needs to be a consolidation of a variety of systems to ensure that they can work together and there aren't any duplicative processes happening. So we call this Project Compass. It's gonna consolidate and sunset the existing data and information systems to support our program, those names that probably aren't familiar to any of you are many of the applications that we hope to kind of consolidate into one. Um, it will provide a one-stop shop or single solution for data entry, editing, auditing, reporting, observer media. So we're hoping that financially, this will be a, a good move for us in terms of um, any sort of cost savings and also um, you know, staff as well to make sure they're operating in the most efficient way that we can. And this solution will also standardize the data lifecycle in the QAQC process from, this, from the time that the data are collected to when we deliver data to end users. Next slide. So we're currently in phase one of Project Compass. Um, the completion of the project is anticipated to take two years as Compass is developed and the legacy systems are, are sunsetted. 
Um, however, the functionality from Compass will be delivered in phases over these two years, starting with data entry, editing, and auditing in FY24. Uh, I think last slide coming up. I, I just really wanted to end with this. It's something that the division and, and the center are really proud of. Um, we've been working a lot over the last several years, but really kind of honing in our efforts between last year and this year on our work to combat sexual assault and sexual harassment with observers. So I just wanted to briefly um, just go over this and the work that we've done. I'm just really proud of the division. So um, in 2021, we just initiated a SASH training for our observers. So we implemented that into our current conflict resolution training, and we broadened that out to all of our different programs. And then in 2022, um, we worked on a campaign um, basically with our research um, branch um, and communications branch to contract out in a graphics company to create a more approachable anti-harassment poster. So we sent that out to all who needed to see it. And then kind of our biggest project that we've worked on thus far has been an OLE action plan. So we've worked directly and um, often with OLE. And so we wanted to make sure they were on board with kind of a plan to improve the support process to observer harassment issues, target repeat escalating offenses by industry members and so on. So we, we really kind of looked at this opportunity to be more proactive with any potential upcoming SASH issues for observers to feel empowered and um, comfortable reporting to us and dealing with it on their own when they're out to sea, rather than a reactive after it's already happened. Um, after we did that, and we're, we're constantly kind of refining that plan, um, we did um, hold some industry workshops between last year and this year. And those we started with the ground fish fleet in the Northeast, um, just to kind of get it out there. And then we've opened it up to the public a couple times this year. And we're happy to do that um, again, anytime that's needed. Um, and we're constantly looking on developing further support mechanisms. We've been working with WVPR um, in order to enhance our training. So basically we're looking for them to train our trainers um, to be proper kind of emergency response and help train in, in these situations for observers. And finally, um, our upcoming work this year is that we are coordinating with the Coast Guard and WVPR communication involving SASH incidents. So working on strategic resistance that will be incorporated into both our initial and refresher trainings and we'll continue to develop areas of support. So we have done, a, a, I feel like, a great amount of work um, in support of this. And I believe that's my last slide. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. And I went through that as fast as I could. I hope I didn't. I hope, I didn't, I hope it was clear. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, on our time constraint here, if we're going to put up, we'll post the uh, your email address. So if anybody has any questions, they will go ahead and send them to you. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to our next agenda item. The Northeast Fishery Science Center Cooperative Research Update. Uh, part of the Squid Squad, Dr. Anna Mercer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Anna Mercer. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I think Stephen's getting your presentation up. Fantastic, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to provide an update to the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Mercer. I'm the Chief of our Cooperative Research Branch at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, as well as the Director of our Narragansett Laboratory. Um, and today I'm gonna be focusing on giving you not an update on everything that we are doing in the Cooperative Research Branch, but really on our new initiatives that we've been focusing on the last couple of years, which the Council um, is likely less aware of. Um, next slide, please. But before I dive in, um, I really just want to recognize the loss of a pioneer in cooperative research that I think is felt deeply, of course, by the fisheries management community, but also by the cooperative research community. Captain Jimmy Rule um, passed away last week, and it's a huge loss to our community. I wanted to recognize all his contributions before I dive in um, to our update today. Next slide, please. Okay, so as Jimmy would say, let's all get on the same page about something. Um, what is cooperative research? So for those of you who are not familiar with what that is, cooperative research is a partnership between the fishing industry and the science community. And when we're working together to improve our understanding of ocean ecosystems and support sustainable fisheries management, such as through the councils. This takes many forms, and I'll just scratch the surface of 
um, what types of cooperative research there are today. Um, but I wanted to get us all on the same page kind of about what cooperative research is before we dive into some examples that we've been pursuing recently. Next page, please. Okay, so the cooperative research branch, as KB just described, we have four long term projects that have been running for 10 years. These are research programs that are addressing long term research and data needs. Those include our Gulf of Maine bottom longline survey, the study fleet, our industry based biological sampling program, and the environmental environmental monitors on lobster traps and large trawlers program or emolt. I am not going to go through each of those programs today. They are large and complex and very important, but rather today I want to focus on our new initiatives. Just over the last several years, we've um, kind of made a change in the way that we want our cooperative research branch and that we're working really to be more reactive to what the new research needs are, not just addressing our long term data and research needs as well. And so I'll go through the projects that you see listed here um, one by one. I will go very quickly as quickly as possible, um, and I'm happy to provide further information on any of these or our long term programs. If the council would like to hear at a, at a later date. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first new project I wanted to describe to the council is our pilot hook and line survey. So the pilot hook and line survey is a response to an urgent need, which of course is the development, the, the rapid development of offshore planning, planning and development of offshore wind in the Northeast region. And you can see a map up there in the top right of all the areas that are either planned or already leased for offshore wind in the Northeast region. Uh, many of these areas, of course, are overlapping um, our long-term fishery surveys, including our bottom trawl survey, our long line survey, practically every survey we have. Um, there is overlap with these wind energy areas. And there's a high likelihood that we will not be able to use our traditional survey techniques in these areas. Um, and while we're leveraging some autonomous platforms to, to continue to collect data in those areas, we also need extractive survey techniques so we can still get we can still get fish. Um, and so the the tool that we're piloting just this year coming up in 2024, this is hot off the presses, is a, is a hook and line survey. Um, right now we're working to develop and document our survey plan, and that's as part of a larger Northeast Fisheries Science Center offshore wind survey mitigation initiative. Um, that plan includes everything from a proposed survey design to the gear we'll be using to the operational uh, to the operational plan as well as the sampling protocols. Um, we have nine workshops coming up in November and December of 2023, and I put the um, clickable link here in the slide, so hopefully council members um, can click on that and share widely. But we'll be really looking for feedback on this proposed design from those who have expertise with this gear. Um, looking for you, hook fishermen out there, um, to tell us, you know, what we propose. Is this the right way to do it? What should we do differently? What are we not considering? Um, to really make sure we're getting this pilot survey off on the right foot. Um, once we gather that input and revise our, our pilot survey plan, we'll be conducting field work in the spring of 2024. We will have three vessels, one in the Gulf of Maine, one southern New England, one mid-Atlantic. Um, we'll be doing um, six days of pilot survey, of a pilot survey, six days each, so six days in each region. And this will really be a way for us to test the operations of this survey, the catch rates that we'll see with this gear, and ultimately adjust the survey approaches so that we're able to assess if and how we should continue these in the long term. Um, so I will have a lot more to present in terms of results on this pilot hook and line survey next year, but I encourage you all, if you're interested in contributing to developing this new survey, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we're really, really leaning on and, and looking forward to some deep collaboration with our industry partners on this new survey. Next slide, please. All right, also in the vein of wind, um, an area we've been focusing quite a bit in the last few years is really making the most use of the information that we've collected in partnership with uh, with with the industry. Um, the study fleet, which is a program that has about 55 commercial vessels participating from Maine down to the Carolinas. Um, um, has captains collecting really detailed information on what they're catching, where they're catching it, when they're catching it, and what the environment is like in that area. Um, and as we've been you know, talking to these captains, which we do on a nearly daily basis, um, I really recognize the need to apply this data in the context of offshore wind to understand what the impacts of offshore wind will be on commercial fishing, particularly on fishing operations. Um, so traditionally, the analyses that we've done to, to kind of try to quantify this impact have used 
vessel trip report data or VTR data. And you can see an example of that on the bottom right there, where we have, you know, one point from a fishing trip in a statistical area, and we can attribute the landings from that trip to that very, very large geographic area. Um, what happens is the revenue from those trips gets spread over large areas. Um, lucky for us in study fleet, we have very, very precise information about where catch is coming from and ultimately um, what the fishermen were paid for that catch. And so what we're able to do in the example that you can see there on the bottom left is attribute revenue directly to um, the areas within and around these lease areas for offshore wind. Um, and so this kind of first step, this is something that we just published this last year. Um, we were using long fin squid as kind of our, our, our test subject here as we develop the methodology. We have pretty high data coverage in the study fleet for this fishery. Um, and we were able to identify um, that the study fleet data and this, or any precise fishery data can really be um, helpful in improving the economic exposure estimates for a given fishery, um, where likely otherwise those revenues would be underestimated because of, of the dispersion of the revenue, as you can see there on the right. So we recently hired a postdoc just in the last couple of months, Dr. Magna Marjati. Um, she joined our group and is ex working to expand this analysis to a different fishery with very different dynamics to really put this our, our, these protocols to a test. She'll be focusing on the fluke fishery over the coming months and starting to think about how we can pull in additional fine scale spatial data sources such as uh, vessel monitoring system or VMS data as well. So a lot more to come again on, on this project. Next slide, please. Okay, moving away from offshore wind and to squid, um, we've heavily shifted in the last several years, really in response to a very clear need for partnership and data and information and research on these species that we know so very little about, both shortfin squid as well as longfin squid. Um, and several years ago, we developed in response to a need um, by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's ILEX Working Group, and then also by the Research Track Stock Assessment for ILEX Squid, um, the need for um, for size and weight data for elect squid um, on a weekly basis. So this is a species, of course, that's short-lived, um, that is not accessible um, to our traditional surveys in the spring and fall. It's only on the shelf in the summer months. So we have very, very little information about um, where these animals are, how many are there, how they're growing, and how they're moving. And so in order to address this need, we've worked with the major processors in the Northeast region, Lunds Fisheries, Seafree Shoreside, Seafree Freeze Limited, the Town Dock in Norpel, and Amory Seafood, um, and work to deploy electronic um, technologies in the processing facilities, which you can see Lucy there on the top right, um, collecting some data using that system to allow them to electronically record size and weights for individual elect squid as they come off the boats. We get this information for every trip that is landed, um, and it comes directly to us in Tower Oracle databases and can also be downloaded directly by the processors for their own marketing purposes. Um, so just in 2023, which I think we all know is not a great ALX year, at least so far, um, even in this type of year, our, our, our partners um, at the processing facilities collected over 33,000 ALX lengths and weights, which is really impressive. And you can see an example of that information there on the bottom right. Um, I want to draw your attention to those what we call ridge plots there on the left. Um, um, where what you see is um, length across the bottom axis, the X axis there, and then week of year across the, the Y axis with the winter months starting on the bottom all the way up through the summer into the fall um, and into the winter on, on the Y axis. And what you can see is that those um, you can see these ilex squid, small ilex coming into the fishery in the early spring months growing, and then you see another pulse of small squid coming into the fishery. And this is information that we did not have access to before. I want to really emphasize that this is new information that was really help us understand how the species and population um, operates in space and time. Um, so we have right now under review a tech memo that details um, the approaches and, and protocols and preliminary results from this project. Um, and we've been really working really hard to ramp up our documentation and training for our industry partners here as well, expanding the different languages that we have training tools for and working on data visualization, visualization tools as well. Um, we're also planning to apply this data that's been collected by the industry in a new um, stock assessment model, length-based stock assessment model that's being in, developed in collaboration with the University of Maryland, as well as Virginia Institute of Marine Science um, and many other partners. Next slide, please. 
All right, staying in the squid vein, um, it was recognized, you know, leading up to the, the long fin squid research track assessment with peer review will happen in 20, 2026. The working group is currently soliciting working group members, I believe, um, that's similar to ILEX. We really need more data on this um, on this species. Again, it's a species that's not well sampled um, by, by our surveys, has rapid growth rates that is very, very difficult for us um, to have information from at the time and space scales that we need to understand the stock. Um, so in this spring, we partnered with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council to ramp up a program that we call SQUIBS, or the Long Fin Squid Biological Sampling Program. We stood this program up in about two months, which is something I am very proud of. <laughs> Took a lot of teamwork and a lot of effort from a lot of people where we developed the sampling protocols, the design for the program, and then identified vessels um, to get squid from on a weekly basis. And so what we're doing is we are targeting collection of about 300 long fin squid. This is the other, the other squid from fishing vessels or Mass, Rhode Island, and New Jersey every single week. Then we have a technician who works up those squid in the lab for a variety of different biological parameters. Um, that includes mantle length and mantle width, which is what's collected through the ILEX size monitoring program, but a variety of other biological and reproductive information, as well as um, statilis, which are the age structures for age uh, for age for aging as well. Um, so in order to do this, we are able to leverage the data collection system that we already had in place from, um, from the ILEX size monitoring program. Um, so we modified that. We're able to really use that pretty quickly in our in a laboratory setting. Um, and then we really just hit the ground running with sampling and collecting squid as early um, as the last week of April in 2023. Um, thus far, we've sampled over 5,300 squid from May to just a couple of weeks ago when I uh, ran these numbers. Um, and we've shipped our first batch of Statilis off to our partners in Spain, where they will be aged and that information provided back to us. You can see a couple of examples of these data from the Squibs project here on the bottom right. Again, the ridge plots where you're looking at, in this case, the, the animal weight um, over week of year. Um, and in this case, because we are, are have them in the lab, we're able to separate them by gender. So you can see those, those size ridges um, by males, females, and indeterminate squid. Um, these data are again in our Oracle databases and will be provided to that to that team that we're working with on the length based assessment models for short fin as well as long fin squid. So more to come on squids. Next slide, please. And the last newish project I wanted to flag, um, which the council's already heard a little bit about, is um, the squid squad or our. Or, or, research on the oceanographic drivers of northern short fin squid. This is one of those research projects where you really, truly are relying on the knowledge and expertise of industry partners to tell us where to look and tell us what to look for. Um, for a species like this where we know so little and we have so little information, um, it's really relied on some deep communication and partnership um, with ILEX captains, um, which has been really rewarding, I think, all, all around. Um, I won't dive into the to the details of this, because again, you did have a presentation on the squid squad um, just several months ago here. Um, but in summary, we have developed a routine where we're having weekly meetings that are open to anyone for industry and science partners where we're discussing what's going out in the water um, weekly. Um, the image you see on the top here is from a website that's automatically refreshed every week. This was developed by Dr. Sarah Saloy, um, where she's pulling data from satellites um, as well as from all of our industry sampling platforms to try to piece together this puzzle. What's going on in the ocean? Um, oceanographically and what's going on with ILEX. Um, we also recently received additional funding to plan a research crew to, research cruise aboard the fishing vessel the Durston out of New Jersey, where we'll be working to map the oceanographic conditions in and around traditional ILEX fishing grounds. For this, we'll be working to deploy standardized bottom trawls, their commercial gear, collect biological sampling at sea, We'll be deploying oceanographic equipment, conductivity, temperature, and depth instruments, as well as um, conducting plankton tows and collecting acoustics. So really, this is our first foray into mechanistic research, real collaborative and mechanistic research, trying to understand what's driving um, ILEX squid onto the shelf, making them available to the fishery, um, and how can we use this information ultimately to assess where, when, and how many of them there are. Um, so several products here, several peer review publications this year, as well as a link to our uh, weekly tracker for oceanographic and fishery conditions. And next year, I will have results from this research cruise that we do aboard the fishing vessel, the Durston. Next slide, please. 
Okay, shifting gears a little bit here, um, another area where we've been hearing repeatedly, um, particularly through the stock assessment process, is a need for more information on from the recreational, particularly for higher fleet. Um, and so what we've done is developed or begun developing, this is brand new, just launching in the last couple of months, a recreational biological sampling program. This is a partnership with Pelagic Strategies, the Caput Center for Ocean Life, um, the Stellwagen and Bank Party and Charter Boat Association and the Rhode Island Party and Charter Boat Association, where we're looking to provide tools to, in this case, for higher fishermen to provide links on our target species with this pilot project is Atlantic Cod. Um, during their normal fishing practices. These are cod that are, they're either catching targeted or incidentally that they're keeping or they're returning to the water. Um, we have very little length information on cod and many other species from this for higher fleet. And so this is an effort to really provide tools for the for higher fleet to provide quantitative information on the structure of their catch. Um, we'll also be working with the for higher fleet in this pro in this uh, pilot program to collect otoliths. Those otoliths will then come to the science center where they'll be aged and add to the aging database. And that will allow us to understand if the size and ages of the cod um, that are accessed by the recreational fleet are similar or different from the cod that are um, captured in the commercial fleet as well as our surveys. So again, this project is just starting. We have um, a beta version of this, soft, this new software that we'll be testing over the coming few weeks here. Then we hope to train and have um, our for hire fleet start collecting data, at least in southern New England, um, in November. So more to come on this project as well. Next slide, please. Okay, um, shifting gears again a little bit to a different species here, focusing on scallop. Um, one of the areas where information is really hard to gather on this species is um, what's going on in terms of the, the distribution and phenology or timing of reproduction um, and disease. So I think we're all aware that there's been several different types of disease that have um, been impacting the scallop population, but it's very difficult to get a sense of where those are happening and how those are changing um, within, a, within a season or within a year or across years. And so we've been working with the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation over the last year to again, develop new software. This is an iPhone app as well as an Android app that can be downloaded by anyone just, just Look for Scala app on your app store. Um, that enable that gives fishermen the tools to very, very easily um, record observations of where they're seeing either different scallop diseases. This is presence or absence. This is not quantity, um, or different reproductive stage. Are they developing? Are they ripe? Are they or are they spent? Um, and so this past year we've had eight fishing vessels beta test this app, um, and now we are moving into the phase of um, really finalizing. Um, that software so it can be available publicly and developing data visualization tools, which you can see on the bottom right there. Um, just example information that we can get from this fleet in terms of the distribution in this case, um, um, in, in this case of either reproductive or, um, or disease information. So next slide, please. Okay, so finally, this is the last initiative I wanted to highlight for you all today that is new and these are, these are our Northeast Cooperative Research Summits and many of you um, who are on the council or maybe in the room or virtually were able to participate in these uh, in the winter of 2023. We held a Mid-Atlantic Summit in Hampton, Virginia on January 31st and a New England Summit in Providence, Rhode Island on February 15th. And these are really in response to a call from stakeholders in um, 2019, we did a stakeholder engagement session to, to basically assess what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, and what should we do better? Um, and one of the things that, that could be done better at a region level was coordinating and communicating cooperative research. And so these summits were an effort to address that need, address that need that was very clearly defined um, for us in 2019. So the format of these uh, summits was was 10 minute research presentations where um, you know industry questions and, and comments were prioritized. Uh, we had topical breakout sessions that where we had panels of industry members and scientists, and we, we participated in a research priorities and extra research prioritization exercise as well. Um, so you can see on the um, second picture down there on the right, those are folks sticking sticky notes, sticky shapes and colors uh, onto big, big posters identifying what they identified as their, their research priorities for cooperative research in the near term here. Um, we also had industry spotlights in the Mid-Atlantic, in the Mid-Atlantic, Jimmy Rule, which you can see a picture of there in the middle, was able to get up and share some of his experience and insight 
an inspiration with the group about the power of cooperative research and, and Dave Gaithel was able to do the same uh, at our New England summer summits. Um, and then finally, we wrapped these days. These are day long events with poster networking sessions where we had equipment demonstrations and a lot of conversation. The rooms were very loud <laughs> when we ended in these poster and networking sessions. Um, so we had really good feedback from these summits. Um, and we do plan to continue them now annually, rotating one summit throughout the region. And we are currently in the process of identifying a location and venue for our summer our 2024 summit in New Jersey. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, and with that next slide, I believe, oh, look, I have two slides. Oh, the last thing I'm, I'm sorry. One thing I didn't know on these summits that I, I meant to flag here on the bottom, um, you can see the results of our research prioritization exercise. So um, where you see the pink and the yellow and the red, um, just to flag the research priorities that came out of the, particularly the Mid-Atlantic Summit here that I'm, I'm highlighting, they were all focused on offshore wind. Uh, many other research areas were flagged as important, as you can see by the other by the other uh, bars there. Um, but the top three research priorities identified by stakeholders in the Mid Atlantic were research on the impacts of offshore wind and fishing operations, research on the impacts of offshore wind on surveys and fishery data collection, and research on the impacts of offshore wind on species habitats and oceanography. And as you hopefully saw on the last sli several slides here, is we are really working to I, to address these research priorities through new research as well as our long-term research programs. Next slide, please. And I think that is a wrap. Um, before I wrap and say thank you and take questions if you have them or you can email me, um, I do wanna recognize that here in the Cooperative Research Branch uh, at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, we are one of many, 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 many groups in the Northeast that are working collaborative, collaboratively with the fishing industry on, on research. And so I just wanna recognize that it takes a community, it takes a village to do a lot of this research um, and really great for a lot of the partnerships that we have across the region. Next slide. And now I'm done. Thank you so much for your time and attention and had to take questions either by email or whatever uh, Mr. Chairman um, desires. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I think at this time we're just going to get any questions sent to you by email and we will look forward to your next report. Thank you very much. With that, let's go on to our next agenda item assessment and peer review overview to spiny dogfish and Atlantic mackerel. Uh, no action is going to be needed here today for this, but the assessment results will inform council actions at our December meeting. Jason, are you ready? If so, okay. So again, the goal is really just increase folks familiarity with the assessments and some upcoming issues specs in December and, you know, start a question list for follow up by the center. Um, not just a timing issue, but they are really the experts of, in the weeds on this. Um, so, and I know like a lot of times I always think of questions like, you know, the next hour, the next day. So um, as things come up, um, again, I'm gonna roll through mackerel then dogfish. Um, but if folks have a question that comes up today, tomorrow, whenever, um, you can email me and we'll make sure we address that for the next go around. A couple of acronyms. Again, the main thing is the SSC sets our upper limit on catches. Um, I'll be mostly talking to metric tons here, which is about 2,200 pounds. So I've been a couple of months, I've been trying to work on like a good way to describe what a statistical assessment model is. Because if I can't convince someone else of they can understand what it is, I probably don't really understand it myself. So this is kind of my kind of ongoing effort to try to encapsulate what the, 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 again, and, and with both mackerel and dogfish, we're now, we have statistical assessment models. Um, it was really like in, I think, 1918, there's this Russian guy published it. It was in Russian for like, I don't know, a decade before it got out to the West, but it really is some equations that try together, try to tie together the biology, fishing's impact on the species over time, and then linking all the data we have into those equations to try to estimate population, fishing mortality, um, and the targets we're trying to get to, biomass and catch. Um, and these models, especially with computer programs cranking, they're trying to tweak little aspects of it, like catchability or natural mortality, or you know these things that are really hard to observe. Um, 
and till the models can reproduce fairly closely all the data that we see. And if the models on a regular basis, year in, year out, can kind of reproduce what we'd expect to, what, what we actually do see, the models are taking that data and then they, they you know, what data do we see? We see the landings, we see the age structure of the landings, we see the survey. The models are taking that in and then we can compare does it actually predict what we see? We don't see everything, right? But some things we do see. So that's um, trying to kind of set the stage for, we have these statistical assessment models for, for mackerel and dogfish. And then we have peer review to, to kind of check it. Is it actually doing that? Does the data fit it? Is it fairly stable if we give it new data? If we change little things, does the thing go haywire? And if it you know holds together, um, the reviewers say, good job. Okay. So this is mackerel um, trends in biomass coming out of the last stock assessment. Um, I have a pet peeve with these figures and that there's a weird floating axis. And if I go in and hand draw the zero line in, you see that we're actually a lot closer to zero than that figure initially would suggest. Um, anyway, um, I also drew in in green are the only times roughly like I hand drew it in, right? are basically the only times when we haven't been overfishing on mackerel, right? So all those other years that aren't with that green bar, we're all overfishing. So it's been um, kind of a bad one-way trip with mackerel. So what changed? Um, well, we added another survey, um, mackerel eggs in Canada and the US combine it into a new survey. And lo and behold, it matches all the other data, like not seeing old fish in the landings, a lot better than what we had been using, which is on the bottom there. That's the spring albatross survey. And then on the top is the new combined egg survey. And so the earlier assessment models were like looking at the albatross, kind of, you know, a little jittery, but kind of trending up through that time series was not matching the disappearance of older fish and the landings was not matching this new egg survey we have um, constructed. And some of those lines are playing connected dots. There are some missing years in there, but you can kind of see where the trend is on that egg survey. And that led us to, to, to where we are. On those egg surveys, this is a cool thing that uh, Micah Dean up in Massachusetts did just to give a sense of some of the shift of where we've seen eggs here. Um, he sent me this recently when, um, the peer review was talking about mackerel, um, or I refound it. So the kind of key thing here is in that red shaded area, that's where we used to see most of the mackerel eggs back in the late 70s, um, Southern New England, Mid-Atlantic. Um, and then more recently is the blue, um, mostly where we're seeing mackerel more Southern New England and um, Gulf of Maine. Canada also does a survey in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and um, they've kind of like done these exploratory egg survey missions to kind of confirm this is really where most of the eggs are. Um, and we're not, and that's kind of one thing of moving to these statistical models, we're not just like expanding up from the survey. The assessment model is really looking at that trend information. So it doesn't matter that we don't get all the mackerel eggs because we're not just expanding up, we're really to track trends. So we think we understand the past better, but we're still not doing a good job predicting the future. Uh, twice, 2019, 2021, um, the stock has really not behaved as we thought it was going to with those assessments. So now we're at a third time and the kind of, um, you know, some James Bond movie, Ian Fleming, you know, th something happens a third time, enemy action, right? There's something going on here. Um, and uh, so, for this go around, we're trying, basically the SSC has been considering some penalties on biomass to try to counter what we are seeing repeatedly as um, over optimism by the assessment. So the SSC um, is um, reviewing the preliminary ABCs they did back in July and the council adopted um, some very low ABCs. Um, because of some process things, it had to go for a bit of extra peer review. The peer reviewers is not final, but I sat in on that. I think they were you know, pretty positive overall is my take um, on the scientific merit. So I think you know, they're gonna say, you know, this is usable. Um, so the SSC was gonna be considering some different biomass penalty options. 
um, that was recommended that be kind of worked through the system. Last time they met on mackerel, the council also said, you know, okay, a two-year average is still low, but it may give us a little, worm, uh, little room to play with. Um, and that, because the catch right now is like barely enough to cover rec and incidental commercial. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the overview for mackerel in terms of assessment, upcoming meetings, and I'm gonna move on to dogfish. Um, so dogfish, this is the, um, again, this is like from the draft management track, um, but I don't think it's gonna change too much. This is a trend in biomass, which is measured in spawning output, millions of pups. And again, not a great trend, but the reference points, uh, and again, my pet peeve of the zero line. Um, so the reference point was at that dotted green line in the research track, and then the management track is, is lower. The, 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 the sense is it's less productive, gonna be less productive going forward, so that's ratcheted the reference points down. Um, again, the green here is when we weren't overfishing roughly. Um, so um, we weren't overfishing when we were trying to rebuild um, dogfish in the 2000s and earlier, but um, uh, a lot of overfishing in that time series too. So previously, we didn't have a statistical assessment model. We were basically expanding the survey, scaling the survey up. Um, now we actually have a quantitative statistical assessment model that's taking in all this information, right? Um, it's trying, it's looking at the it, it surveys, it's looking at the, 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 the length distributions of the landings, the rec landings, the commercial discards, putting all that in with those core equations, try to see if we can predict um, uh, if, if the equations let us make sense of all the data we're seeing in terms of um, the long-term biomass trends. Now, I, I think that biomass target, this thing that just changed a good bit from the research track to the management track, um, I, I, my sense is like, our, 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 we're, we're seeing, I think, kind of the right trends, but where we should go, I think is a bit squishier. Um, and it's kind of the double-edged sword of lower productivity. So we're all of a sudden like magically at our target, but, why did that happen? Because we think it's less productive, so it supports lower catches going forward. Um, maybe around 8,000 metric tons, running through the council's risk policy, that and a yield at the target of 8,000 is gonna give us about 7,000 for an ABC roughly. Um, and there's 22 and 23 um, ABCs up there. Um, you know, we had a, a, a major reduction, 22 to 23, we kind of had to, research track results more or less. We saw the right on the wall. Um, and then, um, but again, possible, depending on what the SSC concludes about this for the reduction for next year. Um, I mentioned this in the peer review. Um, I don't know exactly if they'll address it or, how, or, or if it gets mentioned, but did make kind of an empirical observation I think is kind of interesting. Right now, the assessment says, um, the stock should stay about where it is if we catch about 8,000 metric tons. Um, that's what the assessment says. Um, but from 2001 to 2009, when we rebuilt dogfish, biomass went up by about 80% from about where we're starting right now in 2002 with an average catch of 10,000 metric tons, more than 8,000. Um, so I think that gets into this uncertainty about the reference point and predicting the future and how the stock is going to react going forward. I think the trends um, are, are, are pretty solid, but trying to know where we're going to go, where we should go, um, I think, you know, it's going to be, and this, again, is that time when the biomass went up by like 80% at catches around, uh, the average was above 10,000. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens going forward. So um, kind of the next critical meetings, uh, September uh, September 20, we had an AP. I kind of um, gave the overall one line summary that the AP in the um, briefing book memo, the AP is um, gravely concerned that kind of yo-yo management is um, kind of leading to the end of the dogfish fishery um, and the overall assessment findings don't match their um, perception on the water. Um, 
you'll have the full typical fishery performance report um, for the December meeting. Um, so October 30, SSC will look at this, um, provide an ABC. There's a monitoring committee meeting. What do we do with that? How, how, you know, changing whatever management measures that may be needed. The Spine and Dogfish Committee will meet November 17, and then it's jointly managed with New England. So um, the December mid meeting and the January New England. So again, no decisions today, but that's kind of like um, just a little foreshadowing of some potentially uh, difficult decisions in December. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. That was very abbreviated. And I'm sure if we have any questions, we will gladly email you or call you in the next two months. Go ahead, Peter. Look, this assessment for Mac better. Some dust, tough, tough decisions. All right, with that, we're somehow on schedule. Thank you, Jason. Let's do a Northeast Fishery Science Center presentation on maternal effects. Uh, Mark, and I apologize, I'm not sure your last name, and Richard McBride. Yes, it's Mark Winchell here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thank you, Chair. And, uh, you know, John Hare had asked Rich and I to provide a brief presentation on maternal effects and share some of the work we've been doing here recently. So happy to do that here now. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So, uh, you know, why are we interested in maternal effects? And, um, you know, the hyperallometry and fecundity versus fish weight, it, it indicates this greater contribution of by larger females. And it can challenge the assumption that straight spawning stock biomass, you know, or SSB is, uh, is an appropriate metric of the population reproductive potential. And these maternal effects can manifest in different ways. It, it can, you know, one way is that larger fish produce more eggs and result in a higher fecundity. Another way they can manifest is where larger fish produce better eggs and have may have higher survival of the larvae. Um, and then also larger fish may spawn over a longer period of time, and that's sort of a bet hedging strategy to produce eggs and provide eggs to ensure some encounter of good environment uh, match for survival of the of the larvae. So there's multiple ways that these maternal effects can play out. So I can go to the next slide. And just to kind of review some of the definition of terms when we talk about isometry, allometry, and what we mean by the hyperallometry. Isometry basically refers to just the relation between two variables that scale proportionally in a one-to-one -one way. So what I've shown that there in the blue is the isometric relationship of a slope of one, where you know as you increase weight, the fecundity is going to increase proportional to that weight. Um, relations that differ from that one-to-one -one relation can be called it an allometry, and whether that's greater than one or less than one, you can call that a hyperallometric or a hypoallometric relation. And but we often think about it in terms of of length and weight, and so that's why I show on the right there is if you know where fecundity if it increases uh, as length increases at a rate that's greater than the weight is increasing with the length, then you know that would be hyperallometric relation uh, with growth. And I just put the, also in there that you know the weight it's assumed to be around three, but it's not always three. Um, something to consider as well. So next slide. Um, and just a recent review paper um, went through, uh, collected available information on maternal effects across a whole suite of studies, a wide range of species, and specifically looking at this uh, issue of the scaling of fecundity and reproductive investment, whether it's hyperallometric or isometric. And you know, specifically reproductive investment of females. And in this example, what they're trying to show is that in, you know, for this one very large female depicted in the upper right there, B, um, to match the reproductive investment of that one female may require 37 smaller fish. 
And those 37 smaller fish actually end up having a higher aggregate biomass to match the fecundity of that one single large female. So this is just sort of a good illustration of how these relationships come to play. Uh, next slide. And in their review, they they looked at a whole suite of species that they, you know, and this is where data is available and species have been studied. This hyperallometry seems to be widespread. And that's sort of shown here as, you know, if it was isometric relations across these species, they would be more lined up with that dotted line where the slope would be around one. But in, in you know, it, it's more the uh, rule than the exception that all of these species are having hyperallometric relations with fecundity. But although all this data shows strong trends, it's fecundity data by and large is still lacking for most species. So we don't have this kind of information for many managed species. Uh, next slide. So this is a, just to go over three flatfishes in the region that we've worked with uh, extensively. And before I get into the data here, I just want to mention that you know, this data comes from samples obtained largely from commercial fishers via the industry-based biological sampling program that Anna just mentioned. We've been doing this working with the study fleet for over 10 years to collect some of this data. And, you know, this specifically helps us fill in gaps uh, for samples and get samples from times a year not covered by our ongoing bottom trawl surveys. So for these three species, winter flounder, yellowtail, and summer flounder, I'll you know, the top row here is the GSI. That's sort of the index of the gonadismatic index or the size of the ovary proportional to weight. And the middle two rows, the HSI and the percent dry weight of the liver, those are basically representing the size of the liver and the energy in the liver. And the liver plays an important role in adding yolk to the developing egg. So that's one of the reasons we monitor that. And the bottom row is going is representing a, sort of a measure of the muscle energy um, in the fish, and that's you know a combination of protein and fat. So the two species on the left, winter flounder and yellowtail, they have a oocyte pattern of development that allows us to count all the eggs that are going to be spawned in a given year at one time before they spawn. This makes measuring fecundity somewhat easier. You know, if we get samples at the right time of year, we can count everything essentially and estimate how many eggs they're going to release. Um, the su summer flounder, on, on the other hand, has a different style of reproduction. You can see the scale of that top uh, right corner graph doesn't go as high. The gonad doesn't, the ovary doesn't go into this huge, get really large and then decrease all at once like the other species, but it gets larger and cranks out, you know, like a conveyor belt, many batches over a much longer period of time. This is the way they make up for that. So they have a different reproductive pattern that we can't count everything all at once, but we can estimate, you know, their annual fecundity if we know essentially what the batch fecundity is, how many per batch, and then we can estimate how many batches per year they might spawn. And then when we put those things together, we can get an annual uh, fecundity measure for, for species like that. So these two species have very different energetics and it leads to different ways that the maternal effects may occur. I'll also just point out here um, uh, that if you if you note, you know, these seasonal patterns in the energetic signals here that we're talking about, in winter flounder and yellowtail, it looks like you know they have one broad seasonal cycle for many of these variables we're looking at. Whereas in summer flounder, there's indication of two peaks in say some of the metrics as far as the liver and muscle and as well as GSI. So that's something to consider and I'll, we'll get back to that a little later. Next slide. And just for some background info, you know, we've developed some of these methods and analyzed the first couple years of data, but what I'm, well, what I'll show you for Yellowtail is sort of a more recent analysis on over 10 years, uh, 10 years of data and with these longer time series, we've been able to get a better estimate of the scaling relationships between fecundity and fish size. Um, and, you know, there was indication of it in the initial studies, but we've sort of got a better handle on it now. And uh, although, you know, yellowtail is not a species managed by this council, I'm going to use that as an example for the next 
uh, demonstration. Next slide. So here was some of our fecundity results for yellowtail flounder. And in the upper left there is the actual data. And the red line is the model, you know, model we fit to that data. And that's showing the hyper allometry with a slope of over 1.33. And you know, the blue line is just shown here. That would be if we assumed a, a, an isometric relation and fit to the same data. So it, it, you know, you look at these two lines and you think, well, they may not be that different. But in reality, once you get above a certain size, essentially all the data is well above the blue line. And on the right, what I've got is uh, we summed the uh, bottom trawl survey, spring bottom trawl survey, uh, length frequencies from uh, multiple years. I did this by decade. And this is for the Cape Cod Gulf of Maine stock. And took these length frequencies available from each decade and scaled them to all the same biomass. And then from that, give those given sizes calculated the fecundity um, for for each each of those a population with that uh, essential size distribution, and if scaled it to the the initial size distribution in the 70s, just for the comparisons that are shown in bold there, and what we see is you know as the size gets truncated in time, the the reproductive value decreases, and this is. Assuming you know this is the it's the same amount of biomass, but with that smaller size distribution now in the 2020s, this the, the result of this hyperallometry is telling us that the reproductive value of a population with that limited size structure is only providing 80% of the um, reproductive value that we think it, it it should, or you know that that it compared to the the fuller size distribution. And uh, just note those this sort of I've got the blue boxes and those length frequencies on the right, and that's essentially showing a 39 centimeter fish that equates to the that's the weight is shown by the arrow on where that uh, would occur in the fecundity relationship. So that's indication of you know we we have a strong evidence of hyperfecundity in the annual fecundity of uh, yellowtail flounder. And moving on to summer flounder, uh, the next slide. So for summer flounder, you know, as I mentioned, they have a slightly different reproductive strategy, and which requires us to uh, to have to estimate, you know, a batch fecundity and a batch frequency to kind of get at the annual fecundity. So in this case, we've we've broken these down by four size classes based on quartiles in the distribution and. Um, we have limited data here, preliminary data on, you know, uh, batch fecundity related to size. And all we're also looking at during months, during the, the main fall spawning season. And there is, a, there was an effect of uh, batch size decreasing slightly from month to month. Um, you know, so the batches get a little smaller throughout the season. Um, large fish did have bigger batches, um, as you can see in the colored points there. Um, but the relationship between the batch size and the fish size was essentially isometric or the slope was not different from one. So the, the, the larger females in this case are not proportionate, are not creating, uh, are not, uh, you know, creating more eggs on a proportional basis per batch. But when we look at the batch frequency, next slide, um, we'll see that the, the larger females have a longer spawning duration. And in this case, what we're showing is the GSI, again, the female you know, reproductive investment, that's the size of the gonad through time. Um, and in this case, we're looking at from August to July uh, to kind of you know, focus in on the main early fall spawning period, which is the, the, the main fawn spawning period for the species. And one of the things that jumps right out at you is, you know, we do see this broader season in the dark blue for the large and jumbo fish in that fall season. And that's, you know, 36 days versus 30 days of spawning at six over 30, 20% longer season. And so, you know, you could estimate they would produce 20 more, 20% more eggs just based on that longer season. 
But in addition to that aspect of the longer season, there's also the, the evidence that these large and jumbo fish are spawning in two seasons. They're also spawning in the spring there, in the spring months where you see just the large fish also spawning, uh, you know, in, in March, April, uh, in the spring. And just to get a, an idea of, you know, some of the egg numbers, you know, from a different size, the annual estimates of fecundity provided there, uh, 40 centimeter fish producing about 79,000 eggs and 75 centimeter fish would produce, you know, half a million uh, or more eggs per year. Next slide. So uh, just a couple implications for management, you know, hyper allometry and the fecundity versus fish weight that indicates that there is greater contribution by large females, which means there's a benefit to having a diverse size and age structure. You know, slot limits can be effective for recreational fisheries, but they're obviously very difficult to implement in many commercial fisheries. Although it, it, it may be the case for some invertebrate fisheries like lobsters and crabs where that, that's quite possible. Um, you know, perhaps closed areas and or seasons can protect some reservoir, larger, older females in a population, um, but it's difficult when fish move around, I suppose. Uh, next slide. I'll just, you know, again, highlighting some other implications, you know, because of this, if you can't benefit the, the because there's the benefit to having the diverse size and age structure, and if you can't maintain that, you know, SSB alone may not be a reliable predictor of spawning potential. Um, the size structure matters and truncated distributions may require more SSB to attain, you know, your expected reproductive potential. Um, I'll just point out the maternal effects alone, it doesn't mean that SSB is inappropriate, but it's when you have the combination of maternal effects accompanied by changes in stock demographics that, that the relative value of SSB will not be constant through time. And I'll just uh, also point out that the, you know, an alternative is to use like a total egg production metric and that can be calculated from numbers and sizes of age and that can incorporate maternal effects and that can be used as an alternative to SSB. And there are some examples on the uh, West Coast, uh, several rockfish species that are, are uh, assessed in that manner. Next slide, and I'll take any questions, I guess. Thank you very much, Mark. Do we have any questions? Adam Nowoski. Thank you. So if we take this one step further for management use, my takeaway from this is Hyper allometric means there is greater benefit to leaving large females in the water, but summer flounder are not demonstrating that hyper allometric relationship the way winter flounder and yellowtail are. Would that be a correct takeaway? Correct. They're, they they both they they their maternal effects. There are significant maternal effects in all three species, but they're sort of manifested in different ways. And in in winter and yellowtail flounder, it's manifested in a hyper allometric fecundity. In summer flounder, it's sort of manifested in this broader spawning seasonality that can incur you know resilience to the population if that spring spawning event may be important there are larval collections that indicate you know larvae do arrive at inlets in the spring um, so you know that that's a that's a bigger question Dan Farnham yep, thank you mr chair a quick question do, do these females reach a certain size where they become less productive? Time. So in, in theory, in theory, that does occur. Senescence of old individuals. Um, in reality, uh, most of our East Coast fisheries have been so truncated. We've there. We've yet to find any evidence in in most managed or commercially. Uh, 
utilize species that would show fish getting old enough to become senescent. But in theory, that's a possibility, but there's very little uh, evidence to show for it in, that I'm aware of. Questions, comments around the table? Joe Samino. Yeah, I mean, just one comment and, and thanks for this work, but I mean, you know, in regards to summer flounder management, um, the availability of, of small fluke is such that, you know, having five times the removals of, of small fish that are then never able to get to be large fecund female certainly be a concern shifting type of management. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if that was a question for me, but um, obviously some fish have to make it through that gauntlet. Seeing no more hands around the table, I'm going to go to the audience. James Fletcher. I requested the BOFF study, and this is a total disappointment. It flies 100% in the face of what the Japanese study show. I don't know why it was done, but I request that the council come up and have some foreign scientists come in and discuss this, because this is a total misrepresentation. And it does not show that since the council and National Marine Fisheries went to net sizes that we have increased the decrease of the fish size. I'm just so frustrated I could bite a 20 penny nail into, but I request that the council get some scientists, true scientists from around the world to review this. Thank you for your time. And you will never know how disgusted I am about this re report. Thank you. Any more questions or comments around the table? From the audience? Mr. Chair, this is John Hare. Can I respond to Mr. Fletcher quickly? Yes, John, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Fletcher, I'm sorry that this did not meet your expectations. Um, I asked Dr. Winchell and Dr. McBride to put together the work that we've been that, that's been done in the region on the hypothesis that you asked us to speak about. And so I would be interested in following up with you at some later point to find out what you were uh, looking for specifically. Um, and then if we have the opportunity to, to be able to to meet that mark, I, you know, we try to again, but I, you know, I, I think Dr. Winchell's work and Dr. McBride's work is top notch. Um, and they're really looking at the issue from a scientific perspective and the, you know, the work with yellowtail flounder, winter flounder, and summer flounder is, is very important for us in this region. Thank you, John. Mark, thank you very much for the presentation. With that, thank you. With that, we are going to end today's session with, uh, I think, Chris has a quick announcement. Hospitality again this evening, same room, 819. Everyone's invited. See you there. And with that, we will see everyone tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock sharp. Thank you.